Max says, take a shot for Queen. Yeah, Maria didn't get that, which was lame. I did get that. I literally sang the rest of that song. What are you talking about? You did not sing the rest of the song. I said, yes, you said, I said, uh, he's just a poor boy. And I said, from a poor family. And then you said, oh, Spare okay. Him his life. What are you talking about? I know that entire song by heart, mother. F Come at me. Hi, guys. And welcome to another episode of your favorite podcast, Unresolved Textual Tension. It's me, your host, Maria. And with me today, my ruggedly handsome, handsome, my ruggedly handsome <laughs> co-host, William. Hey, people. Extra rugged, extra handsome today. And what book are we doing? We are reading She Who Became the Sun by, I don't know the author's name. Kelly Parker Shelley, Chan. Shelly Parker Chan. This book is going to be interesting to talk about. Um, because this is one of our Patreon live streams. It was picked by our patrons. So this is um, a book that we didn't pick ourselves. And I just want that to be clear later on when there's a lot of blame for who, why we had to read this book. Um, a couple of things to note, the author is non-binary. So I'm going to try to say they, but it may come out she sometimes. It just happens. Um, also, this is a yet another book with uh, Chinese names, which I am going to butcher. Apologies in advance. Uh, Maria actually tries to pronounce them correctly, right? I listened to the audiobook, so I've had enough uh, exposure that I have some idea of how to pronounce it. This book for me, uh, I started out in the fourth, first fourth going, oh, this is pretty good, and the prose are gorgeous. It's really pretty, and there are some interesting ideas about gender and gender identity in this book. And then if my, my expectation, if my quality of reading started here, you can't see this audio listeners, audio listeners but it's high. It's and then pretty it went, high. Down, down, down. And then, and then down, down, down more. Um, some people are going to get the joke there. I made a fist audio listeners. If you've read the book, you will understand what I am talking about. Um, and I now hate this book. It was so hard to get through. Uh, it, it was just awful one of the one book reviewer i really respect liked this book a ton like she thought it was doing all kinds of new things with fantasy um and like the form of it and i now realize that maybe she has bad taste uh so that was kind of an internal conflict for no, me no 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 this. no 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 okay it is okay it is possible as as some of our patrons pointed out to will some of them have disliked books that we liked and they still love us it, it is possible to get through. This is not a new spin on fantasy that's completely recontextualizing it from old dead European author men. No, this is just such... Uh, uh, I, the author is so talented and untalented at the same time. It's kind of amazing. It's what I've always said, which is that the better at atmosphere and prose and big ideas the author becomes, the worse they become at telling a good story. And so like that is the problem with this book is yes, the similes are beautiful. The prose are pretty good. That Everything else is a mess. Is good. And big there ideas. are some really good, like the big idea of this is actually really fascinating. I went into this book not knowing what the big idea was and ended up being charmed by the initial, what I thought the premise of the book was being. So it was a little bit of a disappointment, but as a big idea, fascinating uh, lens with which to look at something through. So I would agree that I think the execution fails a little bit on the actual telling the story. And there are a few decisions um, that she makes at about that one third, one fourth mark that I think uh, hurt the book a little bit. But I would argue this book would have been better had it not been obvious fantasy. Yeah, the fantasy elements are so weird. The thing is, this book does not feel like a fan. Like for the first chunk of it, I did not think it was a fantasy except for the, this person could see ghosts at one point um and and then you're like oh no there is like uh, and what it is is it's not like it's takes the idea of uh ancient china like the idea of the mandate of heaven which is the a ruler's divine right to rule um and gives it like a magical physical manifestation so there is a sense of magic there are gods there is a heaven that listens and uh allows you fate is not just a thing like it is not the random chance of the universe it's it is a metaphysical power and leads people and also connects different people and i think this book would have worked better if fate had felt more like the random chance of reality and if this book had just worked in a fin like fascinating retelling of historical events but within because it's 
besides adding the fantasy layer, it's basically a historical retelling. Mm -hmm. Now, what I will say is based on uh, some of our patrons' comments is this author specifically was inspired by uh, some uh, Chinese dramas and the kind of worst inspiration heightened uh and it's like if you've watched a k-drama uh or some of uh like it, it, especially like the historical ones there is a like heightened i don't want to say campiness but like emotionality a dramatic, an emotionality operatic. yeah quality to it that i can see here but again i think it would have worked just historical sans the fantasy because the within like especially in the ancient cultures like within the history fate was super important and people talked about it but it was still reality so stuff functioned without feeling like it was cast by a divine hand people just read into it the divine hand and i think this would have worked better if that had been the thing if we had peeled back that layer made this just a fantastic historical retelling with a twist and not thrown the fantasy element because the obsession with fate makes our characters at certain times feel like they lack agency um oyang uh, oyang oyang is a perfect example there's literally a point that made me so angry in the book because he was like it was my fate i was powerless to stop it and and he's made some decisions that he's upset with and he's angry at someone else because that person kicked off his like no buddy you just chose to kill that guy i'm sorry i don't know what to tell you and so the characters feel almost and the story feels a little bit slave to this fate idea again i know that for the time period it was a super important like ideological foundation but it was still reality and things were and and maybe that's what your uh uh book reviewer book reviewer meant is that like the this fantasy book was using um because more so than western fantasy which does use some ancient cultures like a lot of western fantasy is based on tolkien inventing a mythos and a mythology for uh western i think you're entirely right it wouldn't fix all of the problems with the book it might fix like 10 percent, but all of the gender things this book wants to talk about and the power and the buddhism stuff is undercut by the fact that there is a magic system that is just magic like there are parts of it that are just magic and then there's one element uh where it's like magic with more steps but essentially just functions exactly like magic and that really hurts what the book is trying to say about gender because none of it is real and this book i can see the 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 campiness of it um but i think that is such a weird choice to make to be like hey you know that stuff that's not very good I'm going to write like that. Like, what are you doing? Why would you want... For the people that watch those dramas, a lot of them are there for the camp. They like it. And there are, within that genre, pieces that do it super well. And I know this because I've watched a lot of K-dramas. And my favorites that I think are legitimately well done, it's like anime. Anime has a certain campiness to it. Like, there is just an inherent like uh this is like if you had decided to write a high fantasy book in the style of quentin tarantino but two things one quentin tarantino is like the only person who can do pulp and schlock fiction really well so you're already hitting a really high mark and two the only person who seems to have been able to do this well is um oh what's his face from the I'm blanking on his name. He read, wrote a book called Best Served Cold. I don't know. You guys will know who I'm talking about. Um, but there's a there's a fantasy author who did that. But it's like being like, hey, you know all those B-movies? I'm going to take my very intense discussion of gender and legendariness, legendariness and then filter it through a B-movie sensibility. Yes, I like certain things about B-movies, the emotionality, the campiness. That can be fun. It is not paired well here with what she wants to or what they want to say, the author. And it, it it's a weird choice to go, hey, you know what would be good? More abstract emotionality, more craziness in a world that is supposed to be about the fundamentals of gender interaction. Um, and I, I just don't understand that choice. I think it's something where the author was just like, I like this, so I'm going to do that. I don't know. I remember. I think, I think it can be done but I think it needs to not be your first book. And I am going to bring to this table Gideon the Ninth. <gasps> Gideon the Ninth. 
Because Gideon the Ninth is a very serious, very abstract, weird yes. story, but overlaid with a shit ton of camp. That's that shit, true. That shit is campy goodness. But, but it embraces the. Uh, I wrote a paper during my master's about how absurdism oh. and absurdity. Oh. And oh look at look at look at her flexing! I have a bachelor's, I'll have you know, and a master's in tabletop miniatures. What's up? Go ahead. We have master's in what? What university gave you that one, Will? YouTube University. No girls YouTube. allowed to the Warhammer <laughs> YouTube community. Only dark drab colors. Nothing neon. Nothing iridescent. Mm -hmm. But I, I will say just very quickly. Um, I think you're completely right. But the thing that separates this from Gideon the Ninth is that the scale and the uh, grit. The scale is different in Gideon the Ninth than it is here, but go ahead. So I wrote a, like I said, I wrote a paper during my master's about how absurd comedy can be used to hit a level of emotionality that uh, a reader would not otherwise get to without the absurd comedy to like to be the foil slash comparison slash juxtaposition of the, like when things finally get emotional, you are all the more primed for that heart stopping moment i mean and this is where gideon like the the pool scene in gideon uh the ninth so much of harrow hark uh harrow the ninth is is that and uh same with nona there's there's a lot of comedy absurd mm -hmm. like just little moments and then when things finally get emotional you are you were at once unprepared but primed for it because of that absurd comedy and and that because of that camp I, I, I did this uh, analyzing um, the Benjamin Button short story, uh, but it, it I think it, it has value. She here. likes Brad Pitt, guys. That's her kind of No, guy. I hated that movie. I love that short story. I love that short story. It makes me cry. Uh, the movie did not make me cry. Anyway, but the, and the reason the movie doesn't is because it loses the absurd. Like, it, it, it takes all the comedy out of that uh, story. Mm -hmm. But this book while it is campy in that like dramatic operatic setting uh it is not campy in like princess bride camp it's also not funny like that's it the is, thing about getting in the not ninth trying, is like it's not trying to be funny but that's the thing is like that's the thing is it, it the campiness it wants to have is like oh the I, like I've seen the the scenes on YouTube like oh the the army and and the Chinese army in the desert with the flags snapping and everybody in really uh, like dumb armor like that's the kind of like operaticness it wants to have but that does not mix with the the gender discussions it wants to have and just the tone of the rest of the writing and the scale Gideon the Ninth is about a necromancer worlds spanning space emperor where you have dead planets coming down on the main character like that fits there and the emotionality of what happens in like the pool scene with Gideon and Harrow is like kind of absurd in a way and that's what helps make it work um and this I don't think has the two don't play well together um and the writing also takes a dip pretty hard in terms of the descriptions and the similes. Um, at, some, at one point, somebody's face is um, as seamless as an eggshell. And somebody was like, what is that actually? Like, if you try to picture that, that doesn't work. And it was supposed to imply, I think, in that scene that the person, like, knew stuff but was hiding everything underneath a veneer. Like, mm -hmm. like a, a real, like, you couldn't read what was happening. But as a description, like... What does that mean? like seamless? <laughs> Try to also, picture that. As an eggshell, are we talking like they have no wrinkles? There is no features to their face, and and so there's a bunch of little things. Like our Discord was littered with our uh, some of our patrons just being like, "What does these weird similes slash metaphors mean?" The other argument I'm going to make about this book is I think the author could have explored because I am all here for the exploration of gender slash non like like uh in between genders uh like there is something very fascinating happening here and the two main characters have so much potential uh with that and i think the author would have had an easier time exploring it had it not been bound by an actual historical story because this book quick little synapse uh, is the retelling of a um, the emperor of China who brought down the Yuan uh, Mongol Empire that like dynasty that had been leading China, um, and you know the return to the um, Mandarin uh, 
ethnic dynasties. Um, and uh, and this this emperor historically was indeed a man, but in this story, <laughs> it's a it's one of those uh, if what if George Washington had a twin sister and George Washington died and she took up his uh, wig and decided to continue leading the uh, American forces. Uh, so it's one of those. And in this case, it's literally, what if this guy had a younger sister and he died as a young <laughs> child and she took up his identity and lived his life? And unfortunately, it made... So I would say, and I think some of our readers agree with us, guys, leave your comments, that the strongest part of this book, and this might just be me and the kinds of things I like to read, uh, the strongest part of this book is the first fourth in the monastery it is so good and i thought i went into this book as i often do because i am that <laughs> will just go i go will what are we reading and will goes this book and i, I go, make the decisions. okay uh that's literally and then i'll be like yeah, do i happens. need to get it on audible uh and he'll go uh yes or no and then i get it and i start doing the thing uh and so i never i never read the synopsis for our books i don't know unless i've heard of the book before or i've read it before i have no idea what i'm getting into when i start reading these uh so i started reading it and i was like "Ooh, i like this i like this uh stringy like young girl wanting more out of her life and knowing that as an orphaned uh daughter in a famine she will get nowhere but if she takes up her brother's identity and goes to the monastery that he had been uh pledged to she'll she'll be able to make something of herself and 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 just choosing survival there is something i like of choosing survival over and over and then watching that lead someone down a path that they at the start did not think it was ever going to take them down and there's an argument i'm going to make because i've said I've, I've said before that i like the idea of choosing like one choice at a time uh before deciding a major thing and unfortunately in all of these books we haven't mentioned this exists in the hyper specific genre of specifically peasant chinese girl uh it lives in super sexist society and uh Ha decides she's not going to be nothing. She's not going to be uh, nobody. And so she decides to set out in the world to survive uh, something, something. She decides to become empress and commits war crimes. Fourth book, Iron Widow, uh, The Poppy War, A Force of a Thousand Lanterns, and now she who will become the Bleh. The one thing I will give Poppy War is, I mean, Poppy War, she doesn't, at least in book one, doesn't set out to become empress, but does set out to be like super powerful like there's this like i shall be an ultimate power thing going on uh and again it it if it's so early in someone's journey it it doesn't hit for me as well i like i again i like that gradual step by step like a victory of inches or a decision of inches as you go down in place but anyway and i think this author was constrained by the historical story mm -hmm. that they were telling um and because it, it there were certain parts of the story that didn't get a chance to breathe because things had to follow a plot um and also for a character our main character Chu, there are certain things that happen that we completely miss that are kind of foundational to understanding uh her as a character between genders like and I would have really liked those scenes and, and a little bit of time watching her grow I'm up. I'm going to say it. Shu is a terrible character. And I don't mean in terms of the actions which she makes, which are pretty that bad. But like, she is not a good character. And you don't necessarily notice because the similes are so nice in the first third and because she has actually relatively good interiority. But she makes no sense. She grows up in a, in a Buddhist monastery and then that really doesn't affect her going forward. It's literally just a thing that had to happen because I'm assuming that happened to the historical figure. Um, and then there's also a bunch of bullshit about Buddhism in this book that I don't actually think makes any sense. Um, and I think you're right that the historical setting really holds back this book from actually being good um a part of it also is that the whole oh yang and by hor historical setting we don't mean the time period it was written in i think that's fine and i think you would argue oh no no, no no i meant it's <clears throat> yeah. the, the actual his history of this one guy we have to mm -hmm. follow that sorry just for clarification no i and i think that following the biography of george of chinese george washington just doesn't really help the story tell its story um 
And I think honestly, just being in the monastery would have been actually a more interesting story. If she I will, had just I will argue there. that as we as we go on, because I was taken aback very, very terribly, and I was very sad. Um, so I'm just going to highlight some of the com mm -hmm. comments we've gotten. So one of our uh, viewers says, as an agender person, I always hope a non-binary person will write less gender dependent social roles. But here we are. Um, Miss Allie Snow says someone will write the Georgette Washington novel someday. Include uh, the wooden teeth, coward. Uh, I know you're not going then, to. Uh, Miss Ali Snow says, I would agree that the first fourth is better than the rest. It's not great, but there are a couple of nice turns of phrase and some potential. But the further we get, the more that potential is wasted. And then this is in response to me saying, uh, you know, the stringy young or orphan girl choosing to survive, Angry Otter says. But she's not choosing to, she's not choosing survival. She's choosing greatness and nothingness. And that's the problem is very quickly in this character's journey, they go from being like, I just want to survive and get through and get by and here are the decisions that are leading me down that to specifically choosing greatness over nothingness. And I don't love that because there's this, in, and part of it is in the society that this character is growing up in, uh, as a peasant farmer girl, she is nothing to her family, she has. And so her, her fate as a girl, child is nothingness versus her brother's fate which is greatness and she chooses to take his i don't like that she herself and i mean it's she would internalize some of that like assuming that herself as a that had been the herself that had been a young girl was destined for nothingness especially with how much she like rebels against so much stuff i would have liked if she because she, eventually she gets to the point that she's like no it is because i am different that i shall get there but there's a very uh the way that it, happens is super dumb. Yeah, and it's a little it's a little muddy. It's never explicitly said in the novel, but the thing about nothingness versus greatness is kind of playing back to the idea in many cultures that female is the lack of something versus um, the, the the something, right? Like women are men, but without a thing. Somewhat literally, if you know what I mean. Um, and so I think we that's got the other idea. things. Don't worry. <laughs> we got your, your thing, but shrunk down into a more compact space. Also, oh, whoa, 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 that's another thing that we haven't talked about. Maria, this whole time, I didn't know that women just had the ability to read each other's minds with empathy, and you haven't been using that for subscribers for the channel. What is this? You don't understand. You can just see a woman, normal looking woman, and know she's pregnant. What the fuck is up with that? And I can see another woman and immediately know that she's going to murder someone else. Like, I, I, so what you haven't known, Will, is I've been hiding this from you my entire life. My woman senses, they be regularly tingling. That's what I am saying. You need to use that for the good of the channel. Clearly, I can't even, I would be shocked if a woman tried to murder me. I'd be like, whoa, what's going on? They don't want to be a concubine? Uh, be of a conquered city? What is this? I cannot comprehend it. My man brain goes, woman? <laughs> God, I fucking hate this book at points. I really do because... Uh, Anyway, uh, but anyway, going back to it, the nothingness versus something is the male versus the female. But the problem with that is that the nothingness she experiences at the beginning of the book is that there is a terrible famine going on, and that's caused by the Yuan dynasty, right? The Mongols. And so, like, it's never contextualized that, like, hey, the reason you're nothing, you should think is the the external Mongols, and then later realize, like, oh, but I was the last on the totem pole even when there was nothing. That would be... Um, a growth of the character, but the character actually doesn't do that. The character is startlingly static uh, for much of the book. So this connects to the choose surviving over greatness, and greatness is such a nebulous goal that it is meaningless. Eventually, it becomes at the end of the book, emperor, <laughs> because you know, uh, I never felt uh, she was in between genders. Okay, angry otter, did you feel? Because I struggled with this, mm -hmm. where there was times where I felt like she was because she was so hard trying to believe she had taken up the fate of her brother that she was choosing to view herself as a, a man. And then there were times where like, uh, like the minute Ma found out, uh, you know, what her body looked like, started calling her she. And and so it really, I, I struggled a bit with how- The way Shu views herself is bizarre and doesn't really make sense because yeah. she doesn't think of herself as wanting to be male. She doesn't think of herself as female. And she also doesn't think of herself as a gender or non-binary in that she's not, um, she really does not care at 
all really it's weird there's like a lack of viewpoint even and again not in a uh you know i'm agender i'm non-binary it's literally like she just doesn't really think about it except to worry that fate will notice she's a girl underneath her clothing and then the book kind of undoes that at times because later on she talks about how in the monastery she, her most dear wish was to be blessed with the perfect male form and i'm like no you didn't what are you talking about this has never been you've never wanted to have that male form desperately you just have seen it kind of as like a thing you need for de for greatness and i'll argue as we go through it because there's a point where she's suddenly like ha ah, it is because i was already an un, uh, a body without honor that losing my hand meant I was not uh, <laughs> cowed and, and shamed into being less. It is because I already started without a penis that I cannot <laughs> feel the shame of losing my hand. And I was like, that was such a bizarre character turn. And, and, and what it's saying is, it is my woman body that makes me able to withstand this trauma that I've gone through, but not in the sense that I am stronger, I have better pain tolerance, I I don't care about the peacocking of men, but literally that she was already a dishonorable body. And the other thing is like, it's not understood that like, it's actually not the male body that would be a problem there it would be the male mind which cannot take the humiliation exactly. from what happened to her and the problem and here i think is also that the author is engaging with some confucianism and buddhism stuff because somebody mentioned that like uh in the discord that like that's real uh, losing limbs is really bad in buddhism or something like that um and i don't think that actually makes sense with the way that it's written in the book i want to highlight a couple other comments before we continue Lindbergh says the part where Chu does decide to be great makes very little sense, TBH, because she doesn't even know what greatness means until the end of the book. That is exactly the point I was making. She, her decision is just, this fortune teller said my brother would be great. I don't know what that means, but I want that thing. Like, at, at the risk of what, my dear? Our, our, our patrons are very funny. Pregar, so instead of Gadar or Radar. Ah, Pregar, that's sense, a good pregnancy but also every like any kind of marginalized group automatically can sense another marginalized group through the fact that men cannot so okay so there is an interesting idea here about di not just a different roles in society but different spheres of knowledge um in terms of like there is a woman sphere of knowledge and there is a man's sphere of knowledge so like early on um shu when she's pretending to be a male monk uh her pail of water breaks and she's like whatever we'll just knit the rope back we'll just tie the rope back together but he's like but you have to go and give it to the woman folk to do it and she's like oh my god as a man i can't know these things and like first off okay like this is the first of many uh, only things she would know as a woman that don't make a lot of sense but this is the one that makes the most sense of the many that don't make sense just so because of how grading on a curve would, uh divided at the time. And again, that's an interesting idea, but pretty quickly it just becomes magic where she just magically knows things that men can't know. Like again, a woman could want to murder a man. Okay. And this is this is this is key. This is key. Penny Q Lamont says, I kept thinking, did you get the keen sense of womanhood from a decade with male monks? Because there is uh, an idea that I very much truck with, which is that gender and the expression of gender is societally created. It is mm -hmm. what what the presentation of womanhood uh, performance it's, of it's performance of the societal expectations. And this character has chosen from a young age I, and to perform and act in the societal expectation of a man without any connection to other women or things surrounding womanhood. That and is so a good I, point. I don't like the idea and, and I don't like the idea that there is something that like her first eight years of life. That before, is such a good point. Her, her yes. femaleness is an innateness because remember even before those first eight years, she was the only girl in the village or like one of very few. And especially when you're young, you're more agender than you are when you're older and, and yes. you're expected to perform. So that is actually a fantastic point is that this book is actually kind of anti-trans. The book oh, is saying God. that there is an innate, there is an oh, innate God. femaleness that she feels on a spiritual level that somehow gives her the ability to do these things simply because she was born in a female body i'm saying this not maria this could have been fixed by the author just saying 
a sense of otherness. And then looking at Sue's position as an other, looking at womanhood as an other, rather than it being uh, Sue's ability to just connect with woman. Because uh, there is also another character that she connects with, like sees like. And so it's really weird that in all of her interactions with women, there is that like woman sense. And, and there's times where she's like, why would I have known or understood this? Uh, this other character is going to, because I understood this thing about her, she is going to know I had the ability to understand it <laughs> and thus guess I'm a woman. And another character literally does that. And so I don't like that. What I much prefer is how the author sets up, there is this character, Oyang, who is a- Who is the other m main character? We just haven't talked about him yet because there's so much to complain about in this book. Oh, another thing very quickly before you get into him is that, um, one of the things you hear from trans people sometimes is they actually have really interesting um, uh, under or just like tidbits about gender that they get because they have transitioned. Um, so uh, the the always wonderful ContraPoints that I'm sort of uh, feuding with her a little bit after her last video. But anyway, she mentioned that on dating apps, she gets way she gets way more attention as a woman than she ever did as a man. Because you're performing a different gender, you notice all these small things that you didn't as the uh, performing the original gender. And so she actually should have that from like working with the monks and stuff like that. Like it would have been much more interesting if she was kind of versed in the two different genders or, but that actually again yeah, doesn't make sense. She's never actually around women. And even as a young, like her mother died, it was her. And now, cause again, that's why I'm saying if you frame this as a sense of otherness and not an innate womanness because she is othered as a child because she is seen as lesser because she's the last there's two children out of like nine one's a boy and one's a, a girl like everybody like there's she's surrounded by death not a mom not a lot of female presence all of her other siblings before the famine had been boys it's not like she had a really solid experience of uh, and and um the presentation of femininity is always different in rural areas versus in like cities and more uh, centralized areas. Uh, and, and so it's not like she was in like in brought into that a ton. Um, you know, she was also expected to go out and hunt like and her brother and her father knew that she was out hunting and would be like, what did you catch? Give me this thing. So her experience, even in her first what was it like eight years of life six i think it's probably? eight or nine yeah eight or nine years of life were very like uh you know not super surrounded and ungendered and like, yes and it, it felt ungendered and that's why if the author had just couched it in otherness she had been othered by the pe the people around her because of what they thought of her regardless of however she felt, but what they thought of her. And then that would connect her to uh, Oyang and women without it being a woman sense or because she is inherently woman and understands the plight of women because she doesn't. Ma's life and her life are worlds apart. Ma's mm -hmm. experience is completely different than hers is. And so the idea that she can just innately understand and connect with Ma or the lady from that one walled city she had to go into, and then the lady who was going to stab that guy that she just understands what they do because of her woman senses. Those, I think, undercut what the author is actually trying to say. But if she had framed it in a sense of otherness. Or even she could kind of sense when other people are hiding things because yes. she is hide to hide. That would make sense for her Like she's gotten set. so used to being uh, like on and performing all the time but also at a certain point when do you become the performance that's also an interesting idea and, and the thing is it reminds me a little bit of dune where we said the mental powers were cool until they became magic with more steps and like a lot of these things or not a lot of things specifically the whole empathy power just feels like magic with more steps even if it's not explicitly called it okay so another thing we have to talk about is that this book would be half the length if people didn't just stop and think about themselves and fate and destiny all Lots the of navel gazing it's awful it's awful to read you don't understand it's like slogging through cow manure to get through and the cow manure keeps having little like letters that say fate destiny 
Um, and to that point earlier, Miss Ali Snow in our chat had uh, looked through the Kindle app to see how often the word fate is used. It's used 149 times. This book is, and I didn't do this math, Maria did it, so you know it's correct. This book is 14 hours long, so that's 10 times an hour, or once every 10 minutes, more than once every 10 minutes. Miss Ali Snow also says that felt is used 269 times for the Kindle app. Uh, felt is a filtering word. You're not supposed to use those in writing. Um, that's four times every three minutes, she says. Yeah, that's an insane, like, what? Again, the author is both talented and completely untalented at the same time. It's very weird. Um, we should maybe talk about the plot a little bit because we're a half hour to 40 minutes in. Like I said, this is a uh, what if retelling of this one, uh, you know, very impactful Chinese emperor. Um, and it starts during the famine, like we said, uh, there, the, this main character is the daughter of uh, a family, mom dies, a bunch of the siblings die, we catch them towards the tail end of this famine. Stuff is not going good. It's her and her brother, uh, Chu Chongba. We never actually find out her real name or what her name as a I don't want to say real name. We never find out what her name as a girl was. Because uh, eventually uh, the main character picks a name for herself at the end. Um, so I, I don't want to use the term real name. That doesn't work. But anyway, we never find out what her given name was mm -hmm. as a little girl child. Um, but her brother, Chong Ba, um, uh, his dad takes them to a fortune teller and is like, what is my son's fortune? Oh, my, my camera is having such a hard time. It's being very Turkish today. Focusing on my face. Anyway, uh, good luck, us. Fortune teller is like, oh, my God, you are so heckin' great. You, you, I am blessed to be in your presence. Thank you for introducing me to your son. Um, and basically in Zhu Zhongba's uh, fate, he sees greatness what does that mean we're not told it's not like he's like it's not like he's like y'all gonna be emperor kid like it's it's not that it's just greatness and the dad's like oh phew i prayed so hard for this kid and i really like i i went to a monastery and got a thing i, I ooh, all the work the girl our main character uh goes to the fortune teller and what's my fate and the guy's like eh, nothing nothing right sucks now. to suck and then later there's a scene where and i mentioned this because a lot of this is foundational to some of the choices and things the character is gonna make because i'm gonna blow through some of the other stuff later uh, when they get back home their bandits come and there's this point where the bandits are like give us your food and papa is like we don't got no more and they're like we'll find it and he's like here take my daughter and he literally he doesn't even say that he just throws her at the bandits and they're like you know, if she was prettier or bigger, <laughs> and there's this there's this moment where she realizes there are there's been rumors about people eating children, and so there's this idea that had she been like prettier or bigger, like like good eating, or perhaps I don't know if that was the implication, but I took it that way, or pretty enough to be. Eh. Yeah, she wouldn't have made it through. Uh, it's... And she realizes in that moment that she is nothing to her father. She's nothing to, like, a, she is something that can be bartered. And that in an even more well-off family, the, the girls are bartered off for benefits and riches and stuff like that. The seed of her wanting is mm -hmm. happening in this moment. Uh, the things that she wants to overcome. Anyway, uh, the bandits end up kicking her father to death. Once he dies, uh, her brother, Ju Zhongba, is very upset and uh he goes kind of catatonic and then he just dies i it's i the idea is that he gave up on the will to live because he was it's not said but like get it guys he's a man he can't deal with the indignity of this like ugh, patriarchy and so she decides to take his name and take his fate and as long as she pretends to be a boy fate won't notice and again fate is not like a concept it's like a metaphysical power in this book essentially like it's a little more plausibly deniable at the beginning but towards the end it's like literally there's a mandate of heaven which is like you can create like fire this book is dumb um and so 
by the way, we need to call. Uh, we need to reference uh, serious shenanigans who uh, could not be here for this, but needs to be avenged. We see you. We hear you. We understand your sacrifice. And so she decides, OK, I'm going to go to the monastery. She goes to the monastery. Nobody there really wants her. But they let her in after she hangs out there for days and days, not dying from hunger for some reason, whatever. At the monastery, she uh, decides, oh, no, I have to hide and be a man. Uh, How is this going to work? Come bath time. A really contrived. Anyway, there's there's a whole bunch of things that is her figuring out how to survive in because like it's just men and there's no like shame like mm -hmm. you poop you pee and, and she finds crafty ways of dealing with it. A lot of them feel a little overcomplicated or just contrived contrived as solutions. But what it's setting up is that she a crafty bitch. Okay, uh, and I'm using bitch for anyone. Yes. <laughs> um. Yeah. And uh, and she also the other important thing is she makes a friend with another uh, monk in training um, named Chuda, who will not be relevant to the story despite actually being a pretty good character. He's one of he's one of my favorite. There's a couple of characters I really like in this, and he's one of them. Uh, also, Yasen and his brother, a very compelling portion of the plot. Sometimes more compelling than the other stuff happening around it. Chu's and Ouyang's uh, plot lines do not complement each other because one just feels like it's from a different book than the other. We're told in like five pages, like her whole life at this monastery, like it skips from scene to scene every like three or four years or whatever. Um, and basically, if you were, let me ask, let me pose you a question, Maria. Mm -hmm. If you were raised in a Buddhist monastery for, I don't know, your adolescence, do you feel like maybe you would start to pick up some of those cultural values? Uh, yeah. Or would you still be who you are now? I definitely feel like I would pick up some of the cultural values. There, There is, because her, there's a char her character, her friend, uh, Judah, uh, that she's friends with, has a stronger religious uh, impact to killing someone for the first time than she does. But they both grew up in a monastery and I wish she would have had that but she doesn't. This is why Shu kind of feels like a, kind of like a not real character because she, uh, events and uh, um, environments don't affect her really. So she isn't affected by this. There's also a complete lack of her feeling. She kind of feels like a psychopath because she does not feel like she wants to be part of this group. It's not even like there's a longing to be part of a group of people, a brotherhood, and she can't, of to or quite something get there. she didn't have. Right. She like never feels like a person. She just always feels like, oh, I'm still that kid on the streets. I got to be shrewd. And that doesn't really come off as like shrewdness for the sake of shrewd. Like that, that comes off as sociopathic, not as like she's in a terrible situation because she's not. She's she's acclimated there. She's doing OK. So there's this point where she does a not great thing to this. Uh, the guy who's in charge of all the little baby monks in training um and she kind of fucks up his life to protect herself and then she goes and she meets with the abbot and the abbot is the person who all those years ago was like yeah we'll let you in you sat out here kneeling in the rain for four days you you can come on in what she realizes about the abbot is the abbot knows the fucked up things she did she knows or, or the abbot knows that uh Chu is crafty and also he, he says that she knows the way of the world. She knows how things work. I don't necessarily know that I would say that, but I would say the crafty conniving part, absolutely. And what you realize as the abbot takes a swig of the wine she had been making is that he also is out of the standard idea of what a monk should be. He's, he's not just a... And he basically says there are other monks who are supposed to be the super religious classic faithful monks. And he's like, and then there are the people that need to make sure that this monastery functions, that the things that need to get taken care of, get taken care of. And that's me. I do what I need to, to make sure that this place survives and runs because it's important. So there's a sense that his faith, uh, and, and he, he also makes a comment that he's not worried about what happens in the next life. Cause he's alive in this one. And he wants to make sure it's the best version of it that it can be. Um, and so I immediately was like, oh, 
I love the idea because around this is this political drama of rebels fighting the Yuan forces and like this whole thing. And how is this monastery going to play into it? Are they going to support the rebels? Are they going to stay loyal to the Han? Like, what are they going to do? Ooh. And I, before I knew what this book was, was like, am I going to get a fantasy, like political machination story set in a flipping monastery that's badass i was so ready to watch this uh character grow into a smart educated uh but like fiercely protective of the space that took her in and protected her at like uh, but also making moves for better like Lots of interesting tension to explore, lots of ideas, the balancing act on a nice edge. Very cool. Is yeah. that the book we get, Maria? No. No, I immediately, because because suddenly the monastery gets burned down. It, it basically, there's these, uh, the, the rulers, the Yuan rulers of this region come and are like, you have to give us like... 25% of what you earn. <laughs> They're like, that's a lot of, that's a lot of money. Uh, and the abbot's like, no, we're not going to do that. We are above you because we are a religious organization. And it's also the other uh, main character, Oyang. Uh, and he's like, okay, I'm going to burn you to the ground. I will explain Oyang in a second. But it means the monastery is just, like, from one chapter to the next, just mm -hmm. gone. <laughs> gone. And we don't. And we I was like, the aftermath of, We don't even see the aftermath no. of what happened there. She just shows up later on a horse. It is the weirdest, like the author just was not interested in it. It's so weird because it was so interesting. And also I would have liked to see, like the aftermath would have been so good and cathartic to have all that build up. And if she got angry and she was like, I will get revenge for the place. Cause like, that's a motivation. If she's like, no, I want to join the rebel forces. Cause what ends up happening is the monastery burns down and she's like, well, now how am I going to get my greatness? And she's like, well, <laughs> in times of war, the only way to get greatness is to be involved in the military. So I have to go join the Red Turbans and get involved with their military campaign. Luckily, I'm a very educated monk. Um, and so then she goes to find them. What would have been way more compelling than her just being like, well, now how am I going to get my promised fate of greatness? I've decided <laughs> to steal from my brother's ghost. Um would have heard been like to watch the burning and the deaths of all the people she loved like and had developed or even if she thought chuda had already died in like like it's something mm -hmm. to make her genuinely sad like there's no fondness for this place that took her in fed her because there's a whole point where she gets two meals a day and she's blown away being full is painful to her the first time she eats a good meal you know um and so having revenge and being like, I will thwart that eunuch general for burning down my home and I will get. And then when she's in the army and she's like defeating them and stuff and then getting a taste for greatness mm -hmm. and liking the way people are when they listen to her and then being like, maybe I shall go further. Um, that would have been so cool. That would have been great. But no, she's just like, how am I going to get great? I don't think you understand Whoa. something, Maria, which is that great characters throughout fiction are static ones. They're ones that don't change. Their motivation from the beginning of a story to the end are the same. And what you, and if she had done that, that would have been an interesting progression where she changes as a character and goes from somebody who would have never made one decision to another decision through small steps. But I don't think, so <clears throat> we've talked before about how there's a bad habit of authors liking their characters too much. I think this is a case also where the author liked the character too much in that she has to sort of start in the platonic ideal of what the author wants her to be and not actually grow and change and be different from the beginning to the end. Um, I got a very strong sense that the author loved this character throughout the book. And, and the thing is, not only do we not get the scene where she sees the monastery burned down, that could also have just been a like, okay, I was going to be happy here, but now greatness has taken hold, which is another way it's a little bit played like that but not really and then also why would she just be okay with going to war like that's another thing that's very odd is she just is her decisions kind of her 
the fate aspect is too strong. She feels like she's being moved by the author's hand, not really by her own organic motivations. If you had dialed back that fate and just made it a character living through these events and having to make decisions, I think that would have worked really well. Anyway, not what happens. It gets, And also, she spends a couple of years as like a broke beggar uh, monk, just like surviving, mm-hmm. I-, I think. I think that's the implication is that there's some time that has passed. I don't uh, is there? Yeah, no, no, it is because what's his face has enough time to become a leader of the fucking rebels. Remember, I thought, Chuda? I thought there was maybe a week or two. I did not no, catch Chuda that. Chuda has hair and has literally become a uh, bandit. Her friend Chuda is the leader yeah, of that bandit. No, no, no. I remember. Friend. I'm just trying to. I'm trying to think because that happens when she goes to the walled city. But you're right. That does happen pretty quick after. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. That's very, that's odd, but not great authoring. Yeah, because I'm, I'm pretty sure it's been enough time because because they're so happy to see each other. It doesn't feel like it was a week ago, you know, it, mm-hmm. which is originally, oh, there's a two years. Aha, Lindbergh coming in goddamn clutch. There's a two year gap between the monastery burning down and her appearance at the war camp. I did not catch that at the fuck all. I, I felt like there had to be more time than just... Also, we just found out one of our patrons has been sitting here for quite yeah, a minute. Sorry, uh, Penny. It, it, like, with just the, the waiting screen and not watching the live stream. We're sorry. We hope it's enjoyable on the rewatch. Uh, here, here's uh, things you have missed. I described the book as starting like this for me and then going down. No, no, she was here for that and part. And then down. She, oh. I, I read one of her comments. Oh, well, that's her. the thing is, she's left comments, so like I've been wondering what's happened. Like, I thought she was here, but it's okay. This book is terrible. The author just skips those two years and, like, character development... Like, it cannot be at the end of the burning of a monastery and two years of being a beggar monk, you cannot be the same character you were at the end of the previous portion. You were a well-fed monk. So, okay, that is... To- the fact that I could miss that it was a two-year gap shows the problems this author has in sort of just basic writing. Like, I think, again, it's like they are really good at, at similes. In- though They get very purple towards the third second, third, and fourth fourths of this book. I actually felt that two years later, Shu was different, but in a, not in a way that made sense. She was much more flippant and wisecracking from my life. She oh was. my God. Oh, oh like, that's my least favorite fucking part of this book. She gets a character transplant. You remember in uh, The Savage Champion where she's like, you're like, and then Tobias starts quipping. He's the gesture. Like, who is this? Who the fuck is this? Yeah, when she starts flirting with her love interest in this book, it's a totally different character than she was earlier. There's like no match between like, I'm gonna play with this like monk uh, uh, personality to flirt. And you're like, what? This is not who we've met this whole time. Yeah, exactly. As I Swallow said, like, how did she get there? And it's so true. I remember saying in the chat, because this thing, this other thing happens one quarter of the way through the book is the entire first quarter of the book when we're in the monastery, it's only from, uh, Chu's point of view like that's it yes. it's only from her point of view and then all of a sudden one quarter of the way through we get three other povs oyang uh Chishan, and ma and isen yisen uh so there's four but at this point we get three of them very quickly and i'm like yo where did these who are even half of because at least when we're in oyong's point of view we met that guy i was like okay that makes sense he seems pretty significant and he because basically uh what you real real tiny recap of oyong is he appears uh for the first time uh, a couple years into her monastery stay and he's not allowed to go in the temple because he's a eunuch and for the uh, like uh, native Chinese or that one group and also Buddhism he it's considered defilement you cannot go into the temple um, and so they don't let him in and he is kind of shamed by it but uh, Chu also realizes there is a bunch of ghosts uh, I, I don't know if I mentioned this but you can see ghosts that's uh, very dumb and never contributes anything go ahead but she sees that there are just a ton of ghosts just hanging around this guy this eunuch and at first she just assumes because he's very pretty 
that it's a, a woman and then realizes, no, it's a eunuch. But anyway. His whole thing is that he survived when his whole family was killed because he begged to survive. But to survive, they castrated him. Uh, but like now he has risen to be the general because he's like best bros and maybe more with Yasen, who is like the fuckboy Mongol <laughs> prince. Who's like, his cast of characters is actually better. I did like Yasen, though I kind of felt, he's the one character who's allowed to be sexist and classist and racist and all that, and also be a good character. Everybody else and who's like one. that is also like, hey, women, hey, hey. Mustache swirling. Anyway, so he, he appears at that point, and then he's also the general that burns down the monastery. He comes back, and he's like, her, her, her. Because he is bitter, guys. Yeah, he heckin' bitter. But anyway, uh, so that's Oyoung. So when Oyoung comes up as a main POV character, I'm like, okay, at least I know that guy, and he's significant. He's literally the motherfucker that burned down the monastery. Uh, but... There's two, the other characters, you're like, who who are these people? Why is this happening? Uh, and I got just angry where I was like, I didn't know this was going to be a multiple POV book. And <laughs> there's an argument to be made that Oyong should have been included from the beginning. Like, if we were going to add characters, add them as they get introduced. The first time we see Oyong, there should have mm -hmm. been a chapter with Oyong. The first time Ma is introduced, then we get Ma's point of view. The first time the little thief kid who has point of view scenes for no reason it's just to get things that happen from somebody else's point of view but he does not impact the plot in any way Ugh. i always thought of him as the shakespeare uh rag muffin or uh, oh because in shakespeare shakespeare likes to do that thing where there are big events and then there's two idiots making dick jokes like the whole time in the background mm -hmm. he loves doing that thing so that's kind of how i thought about it and like it, it gets you gets a little bit of dividends and that you see shoe from a different perspective but here well, i'm gonna have to talk about how this book is a military is a military fiction but also does not take any advantage of the tropes but i'll get into that in a little bit um there's also yasen gets viewpoints but they're pointless because we don't learn anything about him as a character from them and nothing plot relevant happens from them again this book is really needed a better editor i don't know why everyone doesn't just hire me to cut apart their book but go ahead <laughs> it's one of those things where like this literally... <laughs> angry otter <artist> says <laughs> stefan is that you <laughs> Stefan was not as bad. So Stephon. because because I'm me, yeah, I was gonna say Stefan with a Stephon. P, but yes, <laughs> I am me, so I must do the correct. But like, it's just really like it's one of those things where the extra points of views in particular, because like I will make arguments that from an emotional level and from what uh, Spinning Silver is trying to do, I like the other points of views and what they add to the story but this is really one of those where as i was reading it i felt the will in me be like unnecessary what are we, like it's adding um <laughs> it's adding page counts without anything else the thing is you send stuff added really fantastic what i liked about his was the dynamic dynamic between him and his brother baoshin um that i liked but unfortunately that has nothing to do with the actual main plot of what is happening and so like Ah, and I understand why the author wanted to do it because it is one of the most compelling parts of this book, which is these two brothers who one is uh, adopted and is half Mongol, half Mandarin. Right. So the main guy, Yesen, is again, fuckboy Mongol prince. He is like, he really is. He's like a jock. He likes going to war. He, yeah. He's uh, Oyoung's oh, best friend. Right. For some reason, I did not understand why they were best friends. Um, I understand why Ouyang was his best friend because he's like really gay for him, which I actually... I don't love as a decision because I think the romance cheapens a little bit the idea that he really liked Yasen because there's all this book has a problem with fever touch. It's just slightly better written fever touch than in all the YA books we've read. Um, Maria wisely nodding. Um, and and so I feel like it cheapens it a little bit, but I get maybe how like in Chinese drama that could be like the big emotions of it. And again, I, I do like I do like their interactions because it's kind of interesting. But his brother is you say the name? Bao Xing, also called Lord Wong. So Bao Xing, I knew it was called Bao Xing. Um, who's like half um uh Mongol, half Mong Mandarin. Right, and he is like very effeminate and like the scholar and like the Mongols don't respect him. Yeah, so he is like a Tang Dynasty uh, like era. Like he is the grand scholar, the uh, um, bureaucrat, and that is the Mongol uh, group. They don't respect none of that. And so 
Yasen. And yet they need the him to manage their armies and logistics and, and the uh, state and make sure that the peasants are happy so that the peasants don't do a peasant he's rebellion. He's essentially doing like unman work. And so there's like, oh, Yang is always like, oh, you take on the role of not a man, but I take on the role of a man, but I'm not a man. There's a lot of that. And again, it would be interesting, but okay, here's the thing. One of the things I said in the Discord, you guys really should join the Discord if you're listening to this. There's some great yeah. discussions there. I always feel a little guilty saying these things like I came up with them when really it was like in discussions with other people, but whatever. Uh, just pretend I'm a genius. Um, authors who like big ideas have this problem. Uh, on the one hand, it's good. I like big ideas too. I like complex Fantastic. ideas. They have this problem though, where they want to directly talk about the idea. And so they have characters monologue to themselves, philosophical treaties on these things. And so a lot of the themes of this book are interesting, but they're driven into the ground again and again by characters being very aware of it. This is the opposite side of the author's very good with similes and descriptions, again, more in the first, fourth and others. Um, but they are not good when then that's turned on the character's inner thoughts. The inner th character's thoughts feel very abstract. And <clears throat> I hope you guys have your alcohol with you because I'm going to make a reference that our patrons yeah. are sure of. Maria, take a shot. I'm talking about A Song of Ice and Fire again. Uh, Martin really likes big ideas, but he doesn't have his characters sit around and think about them. And the few times he does, the book is weaker for it. Um, there's, I remember there's, there's one part in uh, a storm of swords where Jon Snow kind of just goes out into the snow and thinks about what decision he's going to make. And I remember thinking like, this is not like the best writing you've done. You needed to get character, the character from a to B, but all you could figure out who you know it is. It's like, it's like in the third Hobbit movie where, um, the way Thorin defeats the Arkenstone is just by like having voices and going, ah, like, like, this is like a really cheap form of character development. This book has interesting themes. It's beaten into you by the characters thinking about them. Whereas in A Song of Ice and Fire, the characters grow through the events that happen to them. Jamie Lannister uh, loses his hand, which will become, I'll talk about again. And that fundamentally changes his role in society, but it happens because characters talk about him differently. His sword hand is all he's ever actually been worth. He killed a king with a, his sword hand. Who is he without that? These things are like maybe mentioned, but their character don't sit and think about fate all the fucking time and talk to themselves about it. It's treated with a much, um, more subtle hand. And there is an interesting emotional relationship between Yesen and Baoxing in that they, you know, Yesen doesn't, he looks down on Bao a little bit, but he does view him as a brother and, in the way also, that their father doesn't. And also is like, like, it, and it's like, just like do the thing. Like if dad wants you to do it, just do it. Then you get to do mm -hmm. your own thing and he'll leave you alone. And so there's very much this like, like I liked their relationship. I liked the evolution of their relationship. I, however, did not think that uh, Yesen, because there, there's a point where Oryang, uh, orchestrates the death of their father uh and yasen automatically assumes bao sheng uh is the one who killed dad and i don't think i think that oyang would have had to actively have put that thought into yasen's head god that part was so contrived it was like oh how did i know there were gonna be wolves around wolves who by the way don't really attack, attack people humans. a lot of people pointed out it would have made a lot more sense if it had been like a boar but this book is <sighs> i you know what the thing is this book has like the pedigree of being a really smart, good book. And so when it makes all these very basic book flaws, it makes me hate it more. But I don't know because A Million to One did not have any of that pedigree. And I hated that book more than this one. So maybe I yeah. just don't like bad books. Yeah, A Million to One was really not good. Anyway, uh, I need to go back a little bit because I'm getting I'm getting a bit ahead of myself. But the point is we get multiple points of views. Yesen's doesn't for the main plot have any real bearing uh except that eventually oyang is going to betray him but that could have just been done in oyang's point of view except that it highlights the conflict with his brother which is a fantastic conflict anyway back to where we were so uh our monk who has been a pauper monk who now is super witty i also one of my first comments when the nine different point of views popped up was i hate jewel in other people's points of view like i was still okay with her in her own point of view but i disliked how like because she feels less witty in her own point of view but then mm -hmm. from other people's points of view there's a level of Heh -heh. Like, like she was, oh, yeah. if you've ever watched an anime and there's that one character who's just <laughs> kind of like bumbling but also like 
you know, like, oh, is, is he actually really smart? Drunken fighting, he, drunken monk fighting style. Yeah, is he really powerful? But also it's just like, teehee, and makes like silly quippy comments. And that you're I'm going like, to read my porn books. Yeah. Kakashi. That's literally how yeah. Jewel feels from other points of view. And I don't like it because that is not the character we have been introduced <laughs> at all up to that point. Anyway, so Jewel wanders into um, Anfa which is the city that the Red Turban Rebels are uh, in. And he, like, wins a horse in a bet. And this guy named Little Ghoul uh, is like, fuck you, you, you stole that <laughs> horse. You're, you're not actually a real monk. And, and he's like, this unworthy monk is indeed an actual monk. I just won this in the thing. And then he's like, you get to go on the front lines and be part of the initial assault, so you get to die. That's Little Ghoul. And then little Guo's uh, wife is like, why are you doing this? Don't throw a... Or his fiance. Let me change that. Uh, little boy's fiance is Ma, who is the and love interest. And this is being told Shu. from Ma's point of view. I started out liking Ma and then ended up fucking hating her uh, later in the book just because I, I don't even necessarily know why. But basically, in the Red Turbans, there are two factions. It's not important which is which. Uh, Ma and little Guo are part of one faction. And um, she is a woman capital W, and her role has always been as a woman. She has never thought that maybe I don't have to marry because she is woman. And um, she is supposed to be the more, I think this is the author going like, I don't want to have like the not like other girls trope. So I'm going to have a woman who is like- Ideally, the like the, the classic beauty. Femme. Aesthetic, uh, likes, um, is is caring mm -hmm. maternal yeah she has that 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 femness um and the problem is that ma actually does nothing throughout the book she's an extremely static character who or a passive character who doesn't actually add anything like if this was a male character or if she was a male character everyone would be like the, the author really and they didn't know that the author was non-binary they'd be like wow the bad representation because she just is there for she to be like Oh, I love her. She's so, oh, our hands tingled. And also she's, there's an innate goodness to her, but also like wanting something, something, something. And um, so, but basically her and Shu have like witty repartee flirting, um, which again, Shu is like all of a sudden funny in other people's points of view. And it's really dumb. <laughs> Angry Otter says, crouching moron, hidden badass. That no, is the truth. That's not even what I'm laughing at. Oh, uh, what? I haven't gotten there. So somebody says, don't forget, Ma is thick. And then somebody goes, ooh, she jiggle like beef. <laughs> yeah, that was pretty funny. Thick as a bowl, a bowl of, porridge. of porridge. And and also, she looks like a prey mantis, which I just never understood. As and a also is very just unattractive. Like, everybody's like, wow, what an ugly person. The entire time. <laughs> and, and which is like, which I'm fine. I like the idea of a character who's just not attractive because it's one of those where it's not like there's some people that were like they just can't see the innate beauty that mm -hmm. you actually have everybody just kind of across the board is like yeah she has a lot of going stuff going and most of the characters think this guy for him but nah just ugly like and it's hysterical because across the board even ma's like and then you look at this ugly little man <laughs> that's all the greatness in and it's just uh like or the appearance of an ugly mm -hmm. little man and it's just hysterical i actually okay all right, so next big thing is that Ouyang is going to cross a river to attack the Red Turbans. So the Red yes. Turbans go to fight. But and this is the battle that uh, Little Guo sent uh, Chu to be on the front lines of, so he would die. And Chu's like, oh, God, I can't die. I don't want to die. I have to somehow subvert this. And he's, like, on the banks of the river. And he, like, or she, excuse me, she gets an idea. And she's like, oh, I know how to subvert this and, and stay alive. Uh, and... There's this guy who makes stuff. Like he's he's a, a tinkerer, an artificer, a like cyborg tinker. <laughs> God damn it, Jim! <laughs> 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 I'm in another I'm a shit tinker. Sorry, that leaves rent free in my brain yeah. all the time. Yeah. So she he makes her some like gongs and so before the battle when the the red turbans are gonna they're gonna break because the mongols are coming and she goes into the thing and starts uh, in the middle of the bridge and starts doing like monk sounds and like and then they all start the stomping their feet and then some statues fall and break the bridge and downstream 
there the Mongols have been trying to cross and it kills 10,000 of them. Yeah, and everyone's like, damn. oh my God, she did this. She has like magical powers or whatever. Um, Oh, we also need to talk about there's the, the red turbans are led by the radiant prince who's just like a kid who has the mandate of heaven. Not just the mandate of heaven. He is the reincarnation of a bodhisattva, which is basically right. he is one of the like, he is the avatar. He has the uh, power of all four elements. He is the prince that was promised. He is the Mushat had Mushat What did they call him in Dune? Yeah, the, I don't remember. Uh, but the Harak. The Harak. Anyway. All of that, um, and he the in this like I said mentioned from before the mandate of heaven. Is, uh, hold on, hold on. Miss Ali Snow says he's like an engineer, and now I'm gonna imagine that the Team Fortress Two engineer in that bit where he's playing on his guitar as his turret shoots things. Um, yeah. Go ahead, that's not relevant. Um, but but uh, and and uh, the the little kid who is the reincarnation and has the the flame of the uh, mandate of heaven, and it has been said that the M Mongol emperors flame is dying like he he only got a little bit of sparks uh and this little kid got hella red flame okay <sighs> this is one of the aspects where again it actually being seemingly metaphysical the mandate of heaven is weird because it's not like okay some people are just like naturally firebenders like one in ten thousand and like people assume that if you have fire you have the mandate of heaven no it's actually like the mandate of heaven like it's it's a weird Thing and I don't know why. But it's weird because so many people have it. That <laughs> yeah. one general, that one general that that lady uh, Chun uh, is with, that uh, her brother-in-law has a little. He has orange fire. The Mongol guy has blue fire. The um, little kid has red fire. And then guess what? Surprise <laughs> if you couldn't tell. <laughs> but our girl Chu is going to get some white magic fire radiant stuff. And so it's just like. It's supposed to be heaven being like we have chosen you to rule and so it should there shouldn't i i maybe it's just a me thing maybe it's just a me thing i don't feel like we should have that many mandates floating around maria here's the thing i hope you don't have anything to do tomorrow because you need to take another shot in a song of ice and fire one of the metaphysical so to today one of the metaphysical things about it is that there is essentially magic in that world is blood for blood if you give blood to this power or whatever it will give you something for it that's what the valerians did that's how the dragons came about there's blood fire with the, the magi all that stuff but basically this is treated as just like a, like an element in the world and the the godness of it is something that people put onto it it is not literally like there is a god there is no um uh what is he called the lord of flames God, I need to reread that bo those books. I haven't read them in a while. But anyway, the, like, the red priestesses guy. That yeah, the red priestesses guy. He's not actually a god. She can just do some magical stuff and assumes it's a god. Um, and like in this book, again, it's not treated like that. It's treated like there actually just is a fire that like says you can become king or ever. Something. Yeah, like if you have it, you are able to do the thing. Which I think is so much worse because it's so interesting when people think they have a divinity or a purpose that is not actually borne out by the book. Like that's so much cooler. And it's also so much cooler to think that somebody just scrapes their way to the top, baby. Like I am just a poor peasant and I'm gonna make it fucking happen, which is what actually happens. This actual emperor from history was just a poor fucking peasant. He's just a poor boy from a poor family. Poor family. Spare and, him this life, this atrocity. And he literally like climbed his way. And so with this, it's the idea that like, no. And there's, this, oh, we'll get there anyway. Anyway, <laughs> mandate of heaven. She sees the, the, the little kid do the fire show. Everybody stomps and does stuff. And that's what's like, oh, if I can get people to stomp really hard. And she's also <laughs> like, I'm going to pray, but I'm going to pray as Chu Chong Ba and hope heaven, when it looks at me, doesn't see that I am a woman but it instead just approves of me as my brother and as she's sitting there banging the gong and praying and all this stuff is happening she feels the eyes of heaven and is like they are helping me and so this is half just her using it's been really rainy so it's very wet and the trees aren't holding like like if you wanted to do a landslide this would be the time to do it but you're gonna need a ton of men to vibrate the ground with their stamping and she's like oh if i call on their faith for the this is a problem too because nobody else notices it and this should be a thing she knows because of her personal 
like somehow this should be like later she knows a woman is pregnant somehow and like uses that and theoretically that makes more sense this like it's not like she has an engineering degree it's not like woman's work is keeping up statues it's not like as a peasant she knows that statues are gonna fall it's like it's just a thing she seems to know to get done Lindbergh says as Sirius said in the discord too to take a philosophical idea like the mandate of heaven because it was literally just I mean and we did the same thing with the um manifest destiny in the west which is if we can do it then we must have been destined to do it like and thus why europeans could just come and take america uh but anyway uh the mandate of heaven is basically uh whoever ends up emperor if they were able to do it has the mandate of heaven that allows them and if at any point they're unworthy of ruling somebody else will be able to dethrone them. okay all right here's the thing there has been a wonderful comment thread here we go also how does shu think she was going to trick gods into thinking she was a man and uh, Miss Ali Snow says, gods can't see under your clothes. And then Lindbergh <laughs> says, I'm picturing the gods playing The Sims with the blur filter on. That's so, so funny. Um, but yeah, so if you're going to have, okay, this gets into a more difficult discussion of religion in books, which I talked a little bit about in Kushiel, but nobody watched those. Uh, basically speaking, in non-religious texts where things can just be like the first order principles can just be believing in God is good. Um, in non-religious texts, if you're gonna have gods, you actually need to treat them more like super powerful, like kings or queens or something. So if there is something directing the mandate of heaven, you need to then criticize that mandate of heaven. If it, you need to criticize it like it was a character or not even criticize, but say something about it, like as a character, like it's unfair that it only applies to men. Um, or there actually could be something even interesting in the idea that gods care about the performance of gender more than they actually care about gender itself. That's and so that's what she realizes. Fascinating. We don't, that's not followed through on. Mm, okay. That's so she's thing. now, she's now in charge. They give her. Oh yeah. Uh, so sh sh she does this thing and they're like, you get to be a commander. And she's like, oh God, I don't. And they're like also, and then little Guo, who is now uh general of the army because he's like 20 and it, it's a political move and it's not a smart one. He's like, we're going to go attack this very, uh, we're going to go get this very big city, blah, blah, blah. And then when uh, Chu is promoted to commander, he's like, you go attack this walled city. And if you can do it, then we'll respect you. And they give him like 500 or 200 men, mm -hmm. which he has to like vaguely train up. And then there's this guy named Chun. And Chun is the uh, smiling, seemingly jovial bad guy. He is, he mm -hmm. is a conniving, he's a little finger, if you will. He's uh, the he's other faction. Within the rebel uh, army. And Chun is against the Guos. So, uh, like we said, Ma, that one character that we mentioned, is the fiancé of Little Guo, and his dad is one of the counselors that uh, uh, supports the Prime Minister, who, via the Prince of Radiance's blessing, is fighting, blah, blah, blah. Um, and uh, Chun is against the Guos and is trying to get at them. And Chun comes to Zhu and is like, I'll give you 500 men, so you'll have 700 to go attack this walled city. Also, the old governor there was a really cool dude who played b ball with the abbot. I meant in like the political sense, not the actual sense. And he died and there's a new guy coming. So if you can get there before then, then maybe you can take the city. And so she likes, she goes out, she gets there really fast. And also she meets her buddy from the, the um, Chuda. and so they decide to go into the city to do some reconnaissance. But what they find is that the new governor is already there. And he's a, and he's a firm fisted dick ball breaker. <laughs> and, but the wife of the old, um, governor is still there and she's going to be deposed by the old guy, uh, by, by the new guy. She's going to lose her house and stuff. And at this point we get the vagina powers. The so senses. the woman senses, uh, which again, Maria apparently has had this whole time and not has been using. Yep. So through nothing, but through small little like, body language things she sees but she's the, the the governor's wife is not showing it she sees that the governor's wife is pregnant pregante if you will and again this makes more sense than the bridge thing thematically in terms of her using her knowing a special thing but it makes no sense in that this is basically magic this is not her and because it's magic it breaks down the sense that there are societal gender is a societal role that um 
uh, you can perform or understand. It is an innate thing, apparently, that you can just people with vaginas like can talk to each other. It's like a hive mind. Um, and so it, it, it's so annoying because, again, it's magic with more steps. Um, and so she and I, again, I think I'm not no, I don't quite know how to phrase it correctly, but I think it really undercuts the gender messages that the book is trying to say. I agree. Because I think the gender messages that the book is trying to say are actually really good and interesting ones. But this heavily undercuts them. If there are different spheres of knowledge, woman and man, and woman and men can, because of their privilege, not understand woman ones, then that kind of makes sense and is an interesting argument. But if the woman sphere of knowledge is just magic, then that's not a sphere of knowledge created by the patriarchy. That's just magic. It's just a, a magic system. If it is just privilege makes men unable to see this stuff and thus, uh, um, true because she doesn't actually have that privilege and has been feigning it for so long and also you know uh and the otherness is able to see otherness in this other person but it also would have been like great if there had been like some sherlockian clues like that would have made it feel not like woman sense and just holy shit this person is super observant like she should have been making these kinds of assessments about anyone who had an ounce of otherness like if she'd been like oh, wow, this person isn't drinking that tea. I heard that this person really loved that tea. And the only reason she wouldn't be is because it affects pregnancy. You know, like something like that would have been really, and then for her to take a gamble, like I might be wrong, but I have to, this is my only option. I have to stake it on that feeling. Again, going back to Dune, that thing you talked about with like the tea or something, that was the part of that book I liked where it's like the Mentats can like understand cool things, the Benny yeah. Gesserits understand these things. And what actually happens is what I don't like later where the, the author abstracts all these small details to just say he saw a bunch of small details that made him understand this. I I, I really dislike abstractness is my nemesis in this uh, podcast, you guys know. Um, and so she then sneaks in to talk to the wife and be like, hey, we'll let you keep your house if you give up the new governor. And she goes and then murders the governor. And there's yeah, some nice that's the, the lady's requirement. You need to, if you kill the governor, I'd listen to you and then I'll let you take this city without blood. And also she has to dress us up as a woman to get into the governor, uh, the wife's governor of wife's place. And that's sort of interesting in that. But again, it goes to show that she doesn't really feel strongly about her body one way or another. She doesn't even view it as utilitarian. It's just kind of like she doesn't really feel the author hasn't it comes off as the author not really having thought about what she should think about her gender identity and so she kills the the governor but the new governor the new governor and again he burns him alive okay there's some nice discussions of his skin coming off like wax um that was pretty cool like his face and she does mention that like she killed ten thousand men but this is more personal but again yeah. this does not feel like she is an actual buddhist monk having to do these things i felt way more pity for uh chuda when he talks about his the accidental killing of his like his first death death was not intentional it kind of just happened and he was it was the one right of buddhism that he had never planned because like mm -hmm. chuda regularly said with women because there's like the lesser things you're not and drank to break, and he drank but like that that was a principle he was not gonna cross that bridge and then it happened immediately like literally the day like or two days after the monastery burned he was in this position and it happened to him and thus leading him down the path to become a, a bandit because it's so instantly severed him from his mm -hmm. monk self uh which again more compelling than what happens to Chu. uh but uh she kills the guy and then she's in jail and the lady's like perhaps i will double cross you and then like uh chuda's forces are attacking and then uh the lady's like oh i guess you didn't trust me either and Chu's like I can call them off. Just let me go and we both can uh, get what we want. You can be governor. Because she also has to talk this woman into being governor. Like, like you you can rule. And the woman's like, I'm a woman. I cannot rule. Which, again, for the time period, yeah. But also, yeah. I would have liked if this woman didn't have to. If the woman is savvy enough to be able to rule, she would have thought of it before this. That's what's yes. weird about it. That's it's not like... That's the point. It's not like she's an ingenue. Uh, it's like... um. Oh, you're going to like this. What's her face in Spinning Silver? The the princess? No. Oh, Irina. Irina. Like, Irina kind of knows what's going on, and so she's willing to take the reins of power. This woman, like, has a weird view of, like, oh, women can't do stuff, but, like, she also, like, plays hardball and knows how to do things, and you get the sense that she's very competent. And the two don't match. Um, 
And then they just take the city. Like, there's more some, like, heart-to-heart stuff that was stupid. Um, And then she just takes the city, I think. Yeah, so they get the city. She goes back in triumph. Everybody is like, whoa, you did the impossible task. And little Guo is super pissed. And then they're like, okay, we're going to go attack uh, this other place, which was this. And there's a a whole political conniving going on where little Guo is like, I want to do this thing. And then Chun, who has been their enemy, is like, yes, I support little Guo in this decision. And Ma, who is little Guo's fiance again, is like, don't do it. If Chun said you should do that thing, he is trying to fuck with you. Don't do the thing. And little Guo is like, don't talk back to me. No, your Woman. place. <laughs> Meanwhile, uh, Chu has already at this point realized that Ma knows more and is more intelligent than the, a lot of the men around her. She is, to give context to who Ma is, she was the daughter of the previous general of the uh, Red Turbans, but he said things different. He wanted to do things differently than the prime minister, so the prime minister had him axed. And so she's literally telling little Guo all the time, my father literally died because of doing things that the prime minister didn't want, be careful. Nobody listens to her for she is a woman. Um, and she goes to Chu and is like, please take care of, like, I know Chun is uh, planning something. I need you to try to protect him. And he's like, I'll do my bestest. Uh, and they take this city uh, and it has a, a throne there and little Guo is super excited about his victory he's he, this is the scene where there's a line of concubines and one of them is going to kill him i hate this scene because it's literally like she sees ahead of time that the woman is going to murder him and then she stops him and then every all the men afterwards are like literally she talks about how like they don't know how to re- react they're just reeling around being like how could a, a woman, woman a woman would want to murder someone I don't what? understand. Again, it's the the book is so clumsy in that regard. Like there had never been a violent woman in in the history of life before. And the other problem is the Red Turban leaders feel like they were super upper class, like ivory tower people who are now having to go to war. They don't feel like people who kind of grew up in a rebel. Like the Yuan have had control of the place for at least a generation. Like it doesn't make, and they have had to be scrappy like rebel leaders. It doesn't really make any sense that they would feel this like dumb. Um, and, and so, and then Gao, Little Bao, Little Guo, Guo, Little Guo goes back and like the prime minister, who's the guy who speaks for the radiant emperor is like, oh, you wanted to become a king. And then he like, yeah, cause uh, he, he sat on the throne and, uh, previously they had talked about him becoming Duke of this city. And one of his friends joked and was like, call yourself king of the city. And so when he sits on the thing and they were like, Duke of the city. And he was like, remember when you said king? And then one of Chun, the evil guys, like, uh, spies saw it happen wrote a letter to Chun and said he sat on the throne and called himself king and the prime minister is like oh he's going to depose me so then they drew and quartered him which is not described but it's still pretty nasty um also before this we haven't talked about um the moment of woman's liberation that happens in this book where ma has gone to shu and she sees that shu wants things and that and shu tells her hey you can want things the way this is done is literally like she says it to her and then all of a sudden all of her horizons are open it's like she took a magic carpet ride but also we skipped that part in um i think in the um discord i think it was limberg was like yeah it basically goes like in and i i imagined it in your old time it was like huh can i interest you in some desire huh like it's literally just like like she just tells her like hey you can want things and ma is like but what if I could? And now she's like really attracted to the shot. Jew. I'm just going to keep mangling that, guys. And so this plays into, I think, some things with Buddhism and Confucianism about you shouldn't want things. Um, and it also, I think, is meant to reflect the idea that wanting things is vilified because it maintains the status quo of power so like that saying about like the people who most who who should have power are the people who want at least well what that means is that the people who already have power are going to just maintain the status quo of power it doesn't you know it, it's sort of an anti-classist sentiment but that's never actually addressed in the book and also all the rich 
people do want stuff and it's never hammered in that like oh these peasants shouldn't want things or you shouldn't want things so it just feels very underbaked and it also is only introduced like halfway through for the first half of the book they have not been thinking about desire she's just been thinking about nothing versus something nothing versus greatness Lindbergh has a really good version of this wanting things that uh are out of your reach leads to pain so each person should be content with their current place which is maintaining status quo I think in Buddhism, it's more about like earthly desires versus not like there's. I mean, it, it depends if you're looking at Mahayana or Hinayana Buddhism. That's what like, I was going to say. <laughs> and, and, <laughs> I, and part of it is just the idea like uh, in the Mahayana Buddhism, which I don't think this uh, era was. I think it was later. I don't remember. Yeah, it exactly. was. Where is Nirvana and how, how do you reach it? And, 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 and so it has more to do with that, but also like. I don't know the the whole idea of desire and wanting stuff and like, so because there's the first moment that Chu goes from talking because there's the way monks speak which is this unworthy monk this unworthy monk this this unworthy monk that and then all of a sudden uh, at one point she says I in front of Ma and Ma's like oh, <gasps> sploosh intimacy I denotes wanting and and needs and things like that Ooh, what what a what a thing Lindbergh has a comment but like recent did uh in whatever their lands are called Jew invents feminism and makes women realize that they can want things again their uh their vagina um telephones walkie talkies yeah. just are going back and like she's back just like forth. hey can I interest you in some desire and she's like eh. yeah but anyway so continue on I, I also realized I need to talk about I also need to talk about Oyang okay. for a moment because that stuff is happening all at the same time. So uh, Oyang uh, is, like Will said, his family had been uh, traitors to the Yuan uh, dynasty. And so they decided we're going to cut your uh, bloodline. And so they were killing everyone. He cried and was like, don't kill me, please spare me. And so Yisen's father decides, okay, I will spare you, but at the cost of your manhood. So I will castrate you. You can choose. Do you want to die or would you like to live as a castrated man? Which is super shameful because... Uh, Oyang is Mandarin and it's super shameful to do. And he's like, I choose castration. And so everybody kind of like thinks a little lowly of him. And while the Mongols on their own don't view mutilation like this as a super terrible thing, like they don't think like if you're if you've lost a hand or something like that they don't think you're like and they they wouldn't do this to other people um, naturally. Uh, they living with it afterwards, they're like, oh not mm. not great and why would you choose to do that but the secret motivation this whole time is that he's going to take revenge on the mongols and the thing is he was just riding along and then this monk fucking came along and somehow something something now he has to engage his vengeance fate he literally rose from slave he was yasen's slave all the way to yasen's friend and then eventually like they went to battles together and then yasen got his father to agree uh and his father is the Prince of Hunan and uh, basically got his father to agree to make uh, Oyang the general of the the Hunan army forces. And so like that is a huge thing to that rise. And so you think Oyang is super like devoted to the Mongols because of their they have allowed him this uh, progression. And then you discover, no, he's here for revenge. But he also at the same time, like prior to meeting um, to prior to the river, uh, event where he loses 10,000 of his forces he's also just like living he generally really loves Yasen he he works really hard to get them victories and so basically what it feels like is as a young boy he was like I was gonna get revenge and then throughout his life he moved, <laughs> away from that. he moved away from wanting that and he just was living his life making a place for himself and then what happens is when uh Zhu calls down the the flood slash landslide thing and they lose 10,000 of their men when Oyan goes before Yasen's father again, he shames him. He makes him kneel and he basically berates him. And it is in that moment that he remembers that this is the man that like killed my family. Because he, he, Yasen's father literally brings it up and is like, you were the cowardly uh, lesser than that mm -hmm. would choose to rather be castrated than die with honor with the rest of the men of your family. And, and it's in that moment that he's like, oh. I have to get my revenge now. <laughs> and it's the weirdest thing because like he doesn't want to, and he regularly is like, "You turn." He like to uh, do. He's regularly like, "You put me on the path of my fate," even though I didn't want to do it. And I'm like, "Just don't fucking do it. You have a pretty decent <laughs> life. Just apply yourself to win the next battle. You'll be fine." And eventually, what's his face is gonna die, or 
just because what he could do, which is something he does do, because uh, step one of his plan is of revenge, is to kill Yasen's father. You could have just killed Yasen's father, had mm-hmm. Yasen now being the ruling person. You've got your revenge against the person that actually killed your dad, and now you can just be good. Like, yeah, you really upset Yasen, but leave it at that. Devote yourself to making Yasen, who's your best friend, and your life as good as it can be, which is what Yasen wants as well. But he's like, no, I must do all of these things now, even though all of these years I, I had been sort of avoiding it and not doing because yeah. he literally blames Chu for for and I'm like what like and, and this is what I mean when there's no agency. It's not like he'd been harboring this seed of revenge and then he saw Chu as a worthy enough opponent to be able to because it, it, he has shown himself to be a super confident general and it's not like he looks at Chu and he goes you are someone who will help me get what i need you are the thing i've been waiting for to enact my revenge without people realizing it initially you are crafty enough you do weird things people won't expect so if i start doing things that aren't uh, part of my normal things people won't immediately notice because you're out here doing weird things and i can just blame you for it so it's not like he's been waiting for his chance at revenge to po- presents him with a way to do it really well and like oh an actual threat against the mongols because like what's the point in doing a rebellion against the people who have held you down put a boot on your fellow people and killed all of your family uh if you don't actually have a shot of winning once you do the revenge thing and then he's like chu is my shot at- it's not even like okay there was a different mongol general in charge and in the river that guy died so now he's in charge of the the uh, or he kills the uh, the father so then he can become part of the general there's no like machinations in that way um this book has a lot of politics but it's not interesting and it doesn't really play through anything and yeah it it, if you're gonna play fate is just a weird thing that just seems to nobody treats it as like this enslaving power it's treated as like the metaphysical themes of the book the themes of the book are metaphysical but then if they're metaphysical then they can't just be the themes they need to be examined and the other thing is like his revenge plan is so dumb it's literally just I'm gonna kill the dad, then I'm gonna kill the son. I wanted some like Count of Monte Cristo shit. Like, what is this? Like, and he kills the dad really early on. And and why wouldn't you secretly just try kill the main bad guy? And maybe this is because the author, and by the main bad guy, I mean the main Mongol emperor, because that's the guy that uh, ordered your family to be killed. And so what ends up happening is he, after he kills Yusen, he he rallies all the Mandarin that are in the area that he's in, and he's like, we should This happens fight at the end of the book. Yeah, this is the very end of the book. We'll overthrow the Mongols. And then you're like, ah, so he's going to kill Mongol Emperor without, like, with no yeah, more pretenses. Apparently this was his, like, and I was like, that's not the big bad. The Mongol Emperor was never the big bad. The big bad was his dad, was 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 Yesen's dad. Like, I don't understand why he so cares this much. I think much. the idea is that the Mongol Emperor was the one that sentenced his family to be killed, and so he blames them. But again, why not use your position? Like, instead of killing, I would have killed uh, Yesen's father and Yesen after I'd gone after the uh, Mongol Emperor, that would have been first, and then savor the last few bites. But again, he doesn't even want the revenge. Like, when he kills his, uh, Yasen's dad, he, he kind of feels shitty about it, and he also in that moment realizes that revenge does nothing and doesn't make the situation any better, and he's still unhappy. Lindbergh points out, Oyang tries to sell it to us as it's his duty to avenge his family, but it's another instance of the book just telling us he needs to do this rather than giving us the contents to build up to it. Because again, prior to the moment, where uh, Yusen's dad is like, bad Oyang, oh, you are not worth as much. Um, <laughs> he feels super devoted to his cause and to Yusen as a person, and he genuinely loves him. And so for them to all of a sudden him be like, oh no, now I have to go down a revenge path. You, Because like, if Chu had never appeared, would he never have done this? Like, what would have been the catalyst? The thing with the duty, too, is it's not like he has a moment where he's like, he understands that he actually doesn't really remember his family or something like that, or his duty he understands is an abstract concept that he doesn't really... Like, there, why does duty matter to him? He doesn't really remember almost all these... He, he doesn't remember growing up with his family, so why is that important? Is it important in, like... There's a lot of ways to play it where he could be more attached to the concept but the author actually doesn't engage with the idea that he's more attached to the concept than the reality of it it's also really interesting that he thinks back to the time before he was castrated more as that he was once a brother and a son to a family than him losing a symbol of himself like like he doesn't like that people think of him as less he doesn't like when people like because he is so uh 
effeminate in nature. He is really off put by women. Like he does not like women. He finds them very gross and garish. Um, uh, but it, I, I was much more compelled by his wanting of the family and like the times when Yasen was like, oh, buddy, be glad you don't have a family to worry about. <laughs> like this shit sucks. I love him, but I also hate him at the same time. <laughs> you don't have to worry about any of that. And Yasen and, and Ouyang's like, dude, you guys killed my family. I was a brother. I was a son. I had all of this stuff. And I really liked that examination, but I would have liked more of an examination of what his life had been like, because he'd been like eight years old or something. So he had a, enough time to still remember what being the son of a general in this area, like, because his, his dad was like, and, and for him to compare how he was treated back then to now, I would have liked a little bit, but some comments I want to highlight. Miss Ali Slow, plus, don't Zhu and Ouyang have some kind of weird uh, Ray Kylo Ren enemies connection because they're both other, yes, there's literally the first time that Zhu sees Ouyang, he's like, ah, oh, or she has a deep connection with him and is like, oh, like calls to like. We are of the same <laughs> substance because I am pretending, like, I am taking on the visage of a man and he is neither. Uh, and, and so I don't really love that, the, like, just the lack of a penis automatically mm -hmm. makes him not. Uh, but for the society and the time period, that makes sense. That's it how they makes sense in it. terms of the gender performance, but it doesn't make sense in terms of the gender essentialism that the book has built up with um, Shu and all the other places. Um, okay, here's the thing. Uh we're almost at two hours, guys, and we, we're still only like halfway through the plot. So we need to, to rush through it. Yeah. Important really things quick, I just want to highlight a couple of mm -hmm. them because I was I was going to go through it, but I, we got such a... So I think the author, and this is the, the connection between Zhu and Ouyang, I think the author tried to show that people who don't fit into conventional gender roles are excluded from so many social places, but it did it in a very heavy-handed way that created an almost physical connection between Zhu and Ouyang. And it is. Uh, he can feel, they are, like, they can feel each other's <laughs> so intentions <laughs> and their anxieties, and they know how the other, how their actions hit each other, especially Zhu. Zhu can tell a lot about Ouyang and his reaction to things. Penny says it felt forced to me. It also felt forced to me, and it, it was, again, that thing where, like, they were tied by fate. And there's literally a point where she's like, you say, I pushed you towards your fate, even though you didn't want it, but you you have pushed me towards my fate in this moment. And I don't, again, I, I, I don't like the lack of agency it provides mm -hmm. in these characters. I prefer the idea of Zhu as someone who forces by sheer willpower and tenacity her way into these male spaces with tenacity and not just because heaven was like we like you enough that we're going to give you a white flame and it's going to help you uh -huh. and uh, like I, I don't like that as much mm -hmm. anyway now that I've said that we're going to blast okay, there's, through there's three things I want to touch on um, basic plot points so I'll go through one then you can do one and then I'll go back and forth okay because okay. I might get this through faster okay um Shu is now a military general and has built up a force of really cool guys who have like fought and trained in peasants. This is the part where I need to talk about how a lot of this book is military fiction because it's about people on campaign and uh, politics within the army, but actually does not follow the form of military fiction and it does not use the form to enhance the storytelling. She doesn't actually at any point have any of the logistics involved in the way that Naomi Novik does. We've been reading this Temeraire series fantastic even the last half which is not very good but like that book has a grittiness in what is going on and how lawrence treats his crew what that says about him as a character and how he grows through that um how tamara grows in the fifth book through having to rally the dragons into their own army military genres have certain strengths within inherent within them horror for example the monster is always some kind of larger encapsulation of a, a uh, like a social critique or something like that. The xenomorph is a giant penis hunting a woman through the bowels of a, of a womb. You know, like that kind of thing. You need to use the form of your genre to the best extent. Million to One also had this problem. It did not really take advantage of the heist genre. This book, it's a military book and it has the shape of military fiction, but it does not take advantage of that. And I think that's to the book's detriment, especially because a lot of the military stuff becomes kind of just abstract later. There aren't like big, 
like if battles aren't explained, there's no strategizing. Um, and that to me, I felt like was a real problem. And a lot of the strategizing happens off screen, like where she's like, I have an idea. And then mm -hmm. like it plays out after the fact. And, and so there really is this like disconnect. Um, and also like a lot of it just feels perfunctory. Like the military stuff felt so, it felt like stuff that needed to happen because this guy mm -hmm. literally the, the emperor that it is historically based on rose to power through his uh, contribution to the Red Turban Army. So we had to be there. But the book is not actually interested in any of that stuff. It this is, is why it should have stayed in the monastery. You could have had actual politics and not all the military stuff the author isn't interested in writing. And just had the exploration or just had it be a political thing where like this person uh, knows a general and has a general friend, but is not the general themselves. And again, that's if you separate from the actual historical story, you can do that. But anyway, um, so uh, yeah, there's that huge thing. Also, Oh Yang at this point kills the dad through using wolves and a complicated strategy that doesn't it's make it. It's super complicated. It's and dumb. then he blames uh, Bao Xing for it. So Yasen and Bao Xing are super mad at each other. Also Bao Xing, uh, th this family insulted him and he, he fucked them up using a, his knowledge of the way things work. And, and his father was like, how dare you do that? And it was a whole thing, but anyway. Uh, there ends up being a big battle where uh, Chu's sent out as a force against uh, Little Bao, uh, not Little, uh, against uh, Ouyang, oh, yeah. oh, uh, but as a decoy. They're actually targeting this big city. Uh, Ouyang, oh, because he's really smart, knows this, and now that he's no longer working to uh, support the Mongols and against them, he's just like, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna let it happen. I'll play chicken with you. Um, and eventually, it gets to this point where. Uh, Oyang and him have to, uh, Oyang and Chu have to duel because they are, the, the message, there was supposed to be a message that called Oyang back to the city and it doesn't happen. But anyway, they have to do this like meeting and Oyang's like, ah, oh, we're actually attacking this city. You should go help them. And Oyang's like, yeah, at this point, you guys were hoping by the time I got the message, it would be too late anyway. So the city's lost either way. Why should I go? I want to kill you, motherfucker. You made me have to go down my path of faith that I didn't fate that I didn't want to go down. And they fight. Oyang obviously wins. I actually really liked part of this in that at this point, Shu, like in her head, is constantly like, uh, like she doesn't know how she's going to get out of this, but she's like, fate has brought me to this point. It will get me out of this. It will get, she is like fully devoted to the idea of fate. And I actually really liked that because you can tell she's deluding herself, but like, yeah. the, and this is not going to end well. And it doesn't because Ouyang stabs her, but then he also cuts off her arm and is like, you got to live as a cripple now revenge, which is much worse revenge than he puts on any of the, the, the Yuan family. For him, it is that mutilation that will completely condemn, uh, Chu's position as a general or as a commander as and and to emasculate because uh, it's it's the right hand which is uh Chu's fighting hand um and he's like let's see how your men respect you now and uh Chu thinks she's gonna die she ends up waking up not dead surprise um and uh has and realizes oh I don't have a hand and then is like oh um, also, I have to say that uh, in between something that we said previously and now, uh, Ma and her got married. Uh, oh, she yes. Showed, she, showed, she showed Ma that she was a... Because Ma's like, oh, I'm just going to get used as a tool for some other marriage now that little Guo is dead. And uh, Chu was like, marry me. And at first, Ma's really pissed because she's like, you told me to want something different. You're telling me to want something different. And you're just telling me to marry you another man. You're just right? another man. And then, and then, uh, choose like, look upon Titties. my body. And Ma's like, Oh shit, you're a woman and you're doing all of this stuff. That means there's potential. If I marry you, I will not expect be expected to be a regular wife slash broodmare. I shall have potential. I sign up. They get married. Anyway. So Chu wakes up. Ma's, uh, nursing her back to health and she realizes oh i have survived because i am i have the body of a woman and it's interesting because she keeps saying the body the, a woman's body not i am a woman and again it's it, this thing that we've said where it doesn't feel like this because it would be really interesting if the if in this moment she was like i am neither a man nor a woman because i have not had that life and while i've had the life of a man I, I like they would fundamentally not think i'm one uh so i am something in between but because i have the body of a woman 
blah, blah, or the mind of a, like, I don't have the mind of a man or the privilege of a man, I can view this. But no, instead it is, I had a dishonorable body to start, and so less chopping off my hand does not break my spirit. My spirit was never in my, like, like I, that was never, the perfection of my body was never something I prided also, myself in. Also, being a male isn't the way to greatness. I can use the things that I know as a woman to succeed. Okay, I hate this scene so fucking much because losing your hand, and she literally just treats losing her hand as like not a big deal. It, this should be, and the problem is the way it's built up is up until this point, she had been trusting in fate. And again, in that final battle, she was like, I trust in fate. There's no way this is gonna win, but fate, fate, fate. So losing her hand should be logically a moment where she goes, oh shit, fate is not gonna carry me through all of this stuff. That should be the lesson she learns. It's so weird that's not that's the lesson. The important she lesson completely illogical. And again, Maria, take an anti-alcohol pill because you're gonna need to take a shot. Jamie Lannister in A Song of Ice and Fire very um, publicly loses a hand. It is treated so much more interesting in terms of how it changes his identity. And yeah, in terms of his masculine identity, because you know, that sword hand, it was so much, it's the only thing he's ever been worth. It's the only thing Cersei has ever liked about him. It is how he has been defined. And now how does he define himself outside of that? And something could have been done with Shu realizing, okay, fate is not gonna take me along. And now I've also lose the privilege that I gained in a man's body. That would be interesting if she realized that like, so I have been able, I have had this privilege so far to succeed because I have a man's body, but now Oh Yang has emasculated me. I no longer have that male body in the sense that they understand in the, it. That society. Right, in the, the performance of masculinity. Now I need to use like my scrappy wits to succeed. That makes sense in terms of what happens and that would be interesting it is not what the author does it would be such a fantastic moment for it to see like i am in charge of this fate is not going to protect me and i am neither but i can use the life i have led and what i've learned about men through living my life as a man and my otherness mm -hmm. to combine and i can i can be yeah you know and it would it would be it would be great oh and Lindbergh also makes a comment it's not only true everyone also pretends the hand doesn't matter except for ma like it's weird that like there's not i mean and granted the author talks about some practical things like uh Ju can no longer eat in public because she cannot hold a, a bowl and chopsticks at the same time she starts wearing these robes instead of pants because she cannot tie pants by herself anymore and there are, there are but it, and so the the author shows you physical ways and practical ways that this impacts her, but the psychological. Yeah, it's there's a complete blank. She's literally, she's so cheery. She starts making jokes about it with Ma. She clearly does not have a problem later in terms of hand use. Um, there's a very perfunctory mention that like, oh, her men will follow her, but only to a victory at this point. She needs to yeah. win. And it's like, that's one of the processes where not having a cast of characters in her army as you would in military fiction hurts the book because it doesn't- Because we don't ever feel them being shaken. We don't feel her her followers and her soldiers being like, we kind of still like you, but we don't like you anymore. Like you need, you need like that to make it feel impactful and have it really have meaning for what the sacrifice costs and for her to reckon with it. The only thing she does have, because like I found Amy in um, John dies at the end's relationship with losing her hand much more compelling than this, like the the hiding it and the like, and because Chu still feels sometimes her hand grasping um, Ouyang's blade at like because he, he he stabbed her and then she grabbed the blade and felt it um, before he actually cut off. So the last thing she remembers of her hand was it being around a blade and she still has a ghost feeling of that but how it works in uh john dies at the end is so much more compelling as a a feeling of like mm -hmm. her hand being clenched and her nails being over long like it was so much more gripping even in that her arm had been hurting for so long as yeah. And then it, they cut it and like it's gone and she has conflicted feelings about whether they told her or not. Yeah, it's treated so much better. And then Miss Ellie Snow says, lucky for Ma, Ju still has another hand. And yes. this is where we get to the part of this video where mom, because I know you watch these, you got to not watch for a little bit. Stop. This is a Ooh. book where up until this point, 
No sexy times. No sexy times. There's been flirting. There's been Ma kind of having a little bit of a, a, a fever a, touch awakening and uh, being like, and also Chu being like, she likes my boobs. You know, like for, mm-hmm. for the first time in her life, she's like, man, somebody is actually into this body that I've tried to keep hidden and let nobody see. Uh, oh, Young has been very like, oh, uh, Yesen, very attractive. Um, and then we open with a chapter. Out of, of nowhere. <laughs> I was, guys, I'm just going to paint a scene for you. I'm reading the Discord because there's a lot of good conversations in the Discord. You know, like, again, if Literary you're not part smart. of our Patreon, if you're not part of our Patreon, join it. Become a book club member. Go to the Discord. There is some fantastic discussions in there, okay? And I'm reading, I'm reading. And then it's it's William going, what? What? The fisting scene. Why was this written? And I went, excuse me, the What? And so the rest of the book, I am just like waiting, and I'm like, who is getting fisted? Why? What? Um, what is happening? Like, I don't, I don't understand. Uh, it comes out of nowhere. It, there's been like a bunch of heavy Oyang scenes, uh, Oyang scenes up to this point, and then all of a sudden, it's Ma lying on a bed with uh, Chu's face in between her legs. And then there's a point where she's like, it happens. It, and, and the thing is, it's it's a progression where she's like, Ma's like, more, more. And I just think of the Kylo Ren meme, uh, more, more. But it, and, then, and, then there's, and then there's a point where she's like, I feel like I can take all of you. And, and the problem is also, and okay. Goes, you did. There's no more. God, I'm crying. Um, it's written in such a cloyingly. Oh, Sirius is back. Sirius is uh, Judo Shu, right? Hi, we just Sirius. got to the fisting. What's up? Um, and it's written in this very cloying, like romantic, almost intense way. And it's also supposed to be like a metaphor, like oh, she desires. Uh, that's the thing that you know society has told her not to, and she wants Shu. And it's like, no, don't choose to do that with fisting. I want to say very quickly. I don't want to kink shame. Lots of people in real life are into this. That's fine. But if we walked into a hard, like a, we just opened the chapter with Oh Yang in a furry suit, that would also be super weird. It's okay to like these things in real life, but it's weird in fiction when we suddenly jump into it in tonally. Especially with no lead up. Like there has mm-hmm. been no, there's been like baby, like sweet sexual awakenings up to this point. And the thing is, this scene is written very sweetly, you know. Oh, uh, uh, Chu is sweet. very caring. Like, is, is it okay? Am I hurting you? And uh, but it's it's just <laughs> it's a lot, and it's and out it, of it's, place. And it's just out of place. It's one of those things where this has added nothing. This has added nothing to this because because and there's an ending uh serious mentions i love the fisting moment that the results that results in is this not love because there's literally a point where ma's lying there and she's like the could this could this feeling be anything other than love what i am feeling uh for Chu right now Lindbergh says i was going to say it was the most sensuous <laughs> fisting scene i've ever read but it's the only <laughs> fisting scene i've read <laughs> <laughs> it's mostly the surprise that threw me off which again was me as well because i get what it was trying to do it was supposed to be this very like the two of them exploring expanding their <laughs> not the only thing <laughs> having to expand up, there opening up like and, and just like but i don't i don't it's so sudden and it's so out of place and it, it adds nothing some people in real life like waterworks they like pee but if we opened on this book with Oh Yang peeing on someone, that would be fucking weird. And that would be something where, yes, it's a legitimate thing you can like in real life, but making it like, and then he put a golden shower upon, you know, Yesen, much like in the way that Yesen was a golden man before the eyes of the Yuan. And you're like, no, don't try to make this a metaphor. This is this is for a smut book. Don't put that in here. It's so weird. And it's, it's just really odd because it, there's no lead up there's no there's no like oh this was something that like it, I, I see how we got yeah no uh judo shu says zoo's romantic experience is kiss touch kiss okay. touch boob oral and then fist it's like rock paper scissors fist 
Anyway, so that scene happens. It's not great. It, what it's supposed to do is that these two are very, like, they're into each other. They're having a relationship. They even, like, um, it, it's a functional marriage. You know, they've consummated. I don't like them. She, Ma becomes increasingly, like, annoying in terms of, like, she just doesn't feel like a strong character. And I don't mean strong in the sense of, like, you know, when people say strong female character, she just feels very like, I'm going to do what Shu wants to do, and I like her, and my fatal flaw is that I desire her. And so I'll put up with all the weird shit she does. The whole point is that Ma is supposed to make... Ma is the empathy and kindness that True doesn't inherently have, and, and thus she needs her to bring that into her life to make sure she doesn't become like Chun, who is a terrible guy. Uh, also, eventually they defeat Chun, and the, the Prime Minister dies, and now they have the Prince of Radiance. But anyway, um, and that's why she has Ma. And so Ma's entire purpose is to be like, but don't do that, that's not morally correct correct uh like you shouldn't that's that's who are we serving if we do that <laughs> those choices and like that becomes her purpose and it, it feels more like it's it just exists to be like she exists to be the voice of reason for Chu, but also in a really where like there rarely is a point where she stops and goes you're you're right i need to reassess what i'm doing there's only one point where she goes you're right let me try an alternate thing here and also i, I don't mention that but she, she lets her during her wedding party, she lets her entire troops eat food that ghosts have eaten out of, and it starts a plague. Lots of her troops die, but it's also treated as like, eh, whatever, it happens, it happens. And it's it's done to avoid having to fight against the people that Ma does not want her to fight against. The other problem with this book is the reason that Shu seems so self-absorbed, and um, it, it's weird the book doesn't and why it feels weird the book doesn't portray her as more of a sociopath that she is or isn't aware that she is, is there's no real discussion of like the peasantry or the class issues at play or like the Yuan versus the Mandarin. Mandarin? Mandarin. Mandarin. That aspect of the book is totally lacking. She's only, re she's only interest in this entire war and ethnic conflict is, hey, I want to be great. That's it. That's it. And Not so it, free the people. It's all about her. At least in Poppy War, it initially starts with like, I want to better mm -hmm. actually no it, it kind of comes in the middle where she's like I want to better like the lives of people and like there was a great injustice and I need to fight against this great injustice and I have revenge and anger in my heart well even even in Poppy War when the Japanese analogs start doing terrible things she cares in this book yep. again Shu was raised in a famine caused by the Yuan or at least you to have been caused by them. So why doesn't she dislike them more? Why doesn't she think we're not going to have any more famines like that? She literally is just so self-absorbed. And you have to understand that I'm not just saying this like, oh, she thinks about herself a lot. She thinks about herself constantly. This book is constantly hammering you with the themes of just stated very outright. Um, it's, it's a very, somebody, an editor should have gone in and cut like 50 to 70% of it. A really good example of how it, it's very showy and not, it's very telly, not showy with these internal thoughts. When Oyang does the revenge, it's not like he lives a while, sees the results of it, realizes he feels the same, like that nothing inside. He literally has, the narration goes, he realized that revenge had changed nothing. It would not bring his family back to life. Like the scene after he, he does the thing, he's like, wow, it did nothing. I'm just doing this for duty. And it, it tells you that. It doesn't show you that. It doesn't take you on the journey to his realization. It just happens. And then basically the only, Oh Yang gets his revenge. He kills Yusen. It, it's, it's sort of a touching scene, but also kind of like, why did you do that? Yeah, I don't understand why you had to kill Yusen. Like, like, or I, I mean, I guess I did to make sure that that his bloodline wouldn't continue. I, I mean, I would have liked it more if he had like castrated Yusen or something. Like that would have been at least more interesting. Again, I was looking for more like if you're gonna if you're gonna spend twenty years planning revenge, make it a Monte Cristo revenge, like uh, really operatic. Um, and the last thing that um, uh, Shu does is she is now like the sole power, um, and she has control of the Radiant Prince, um, and then. She just goes outside and old yellers him. She just murders him because Look she wants- Look at the moon. Keep looking at the moon, little buddy. <laughs> That's literally what it is. <laughs> and like Ma had cuddled with him one time. So she was like, I can't believe you did that. And she was like, I'm sorry, I had to. And Ma is like, oh, because I desire things and I desire her, I'm going to have to put up with things. 
I'm going to have to put up with her doing a lot of terrible things. Oh, we don't even get that thought. Literally, Ma comes and is like, you are a terrible person. Why would you do that? And she's like, because you're just like everybody else. You're just like Chun. You said you didn't want to be. And she's like, no, I am different because. And then she casts herself in the white light that is her mandate of heaven. And uh, or and no, uh, she doesn't. She doesn't do that. But uh, she goes to her. You have the mandate of heaven. Ma goes to her. You have the mandate of heaven. Don't you? And she's yeah. like, I do. And that's why I'm different because I have it and I shall be the ruler. And then Ma's like, I don't know if I can be with you anymore. And she leaves. And then uh, Chu goes out and is like, people of the place where I rule, I, the Prince of Ra Radiance is dead, but look at me. I got sparkly white stuff. I shall be emperor. And this is the point where um, she renames herself instead of being Chu Chong Ba, which was her brother's name uh, that she was using this whole time. Uh, she changes it to the name of the actual emperor, which was Chu uh, Something Wong with a Z. Chung, I think. Um, I, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that one because it was only ever said once in the book. So I don't know if I have an accurate pronunciation, but it's the name of the actual, that the actual emperor. I noticed that you didn't do it because, right. Uh, the and the emperor himself, to be fair, had also was born Chu Chongba and then changed his name as well. Um, so it is something that actually happened where this guy changed his name. Um, but it is it is framed as Chu choosing a name for herself. It, it she is not the young peasant girl in the famine. She's not Chu Chongba. She has cast aside both of those things. She is now taking this new name. And then as she's doing this whole thing, uh, Ma comes up in this super intense red gown and like all the people are <laughs> bowing, bathed in the radiant light. And she comes up and she like bows before Chu and is like, I shall be your empress. And Chu is like, My ride or die, baby. <laughs> like, yeah, you will. What, what, what? And um, I wonder if in the second book, they like, do they have her to keep up the pretense? Do they have like Chuda impregnate Ma, or do the oh that'd be does clever? Does he get con concubines to get pregnant? Like, and that's how they continue the line, so people think think uh, that stuff is that happening. That actually would make a lot of sense, yeah, because he's the one person that like she trusts and would not hide from her, or wouldn't uh, betray her. So that's the book in the hyper specific genre of peasant girl becomes war criminal. Um, this is again, I think it's the second best, but only by virtue of like having pretty writing in the first fourth or so like it's iron widow is so bad and problematic poppy war is just badly written and this one uh, why are they all problematic like none know. of the authors are able to handle that i have a main anti-hero well in this one it's really again the thing that upsets me the most is that idea of that like even though uh, this character has lived the life of a man, an othered man, absolutely, with an absolute sense of otherness, which is why I'm okay with the comparison to um, uh, Ouyang, uh, is also essentialized to having, like, being able to understand the lived experiences and experience and uh, feelings of other women, uh, but they haven't had that. Like, I, I don't like that. That feels, mm, and it just, like, <sighs> Judo Shru says, uh, uh, and this is serious shenanigans uh, for our patrons. Like, I have trouble with this because what is the end goal? To be the best? Be number one? Like, we know she will become emperor, but the character doesn't. And it's so nebulous. Uh, there needed <laughs> to be a lot more <laughs> uh, Miss Allie Snow also says, Drew's goal is also too vague for me to ever give a shit about it. And then Penny also brings up, I don't believe Ma would go along with child murder. Uh, Lindbergh also says nah. And then Miss Alice knows it's all cool. I killed the kid because <laughs> fate. I didn't have to force myself to read this book. You know, in, in Poppy War, there were times where I had to try slog through it. Like it wasn't as easy of a read. This was an easier read for me than Poppy War was because uh, I I think there was a lot of side characters I liked more. Like I liked Jisan. I liked Bao Shing. I liked ma initially. you know the only character i liked is the guy that's bitchy to o yang but is part of the the mandarin uprising i don't know who he oh. is but i thought he was really funny Cho, i think I, yeah i, I, I just thought it was funny talking. that o yang really didn't like him and he was kind of a crass character but like yeah he's a good dude so i liked some of the surrounding things that were happening uh but it was one of those things where it felt like if this author would have written this book 
a couple books down the line, I think it would have been so much better because again, I like the big idea here. I think there's ways to do it a little bit better um, for at this stage, like to make it a little bit of a simpler story, but to explore these themes. I like the themes. I like the initial premise. And I really did enjoy the first fourth of the book. And I, I there were points that I enjoyed, but there was never a point where I was like, fist bump, yeah. Uh, you you figured this out. You did the thing. It was so hard to get through. That last half, just it was just toxic sludge. I was just going through, and I was like, I can't, I can't handle this. Why is she talking about fate in her head yet again? When I tell you, they talk, they think about fate <laughs> all, and fate is fate is guiding me. Fate is pulling me along. Fate is dragging me towards these goals. And again, I understand that it is a bit of a genre convention for Chinese historicals and, and, and for the period where fate was a huge pulling thing. And that's why I think it would have been better if they just wrote it like a non-fantasy things where fate wasn't an actual presence pulling you along and giving you a naval connection with somebody else. That's why I think the operatic operaticness of it is a problem. Um, and I don't think pairs well. I think it's because, you know, Iron Widow also had some of that where the author said that they really liked, you know, Chinese costume dramas or something. And I'm like, guys, no, <laughs> stop. Stop picking bad things to be inspired by. You're not talented enough. I think uh, first books are tough for authors if they haven't written a lot of fan fiction first. And so to try to just come out of the gate with such an ambitious idea, I think is just really hard. I don't know. I could see in like five or six books if the author, the thing is though, I don't think the author is going to become better. I think this is an Iron Widow situation where the author has gotten accolades for being good at what they did and their book being good. And so they're not going to feel a need to improve. It's going to be kind of I, a JK I, Rowling situation. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to take the devil advocate uh, point of view. And that is, I think, I think this author might surprise us. And, and do, because again, I think there's a lot of potential here. And uh, it, it's kind of like sometimes authors need to write within a smaller scope mm -hmm. to tell a really tight story um, and uh, to kind of work through some of that. And, and it's kind of like, because I think about it, the uh, Lee Bardugo. We did not like Shadow and Bone mm, at yes. all, but the world loved it. She was lauded. Lauded William. <sighs> Ninth House was so was so much better. Yeah, yes, it all right. Issues in me, but it was so much better. Fair so enough. I, don't think, I think that writers that genuinely, and I think this writer is one of those. And and so please don't take the criticisms we have put down. I think this author cares enough about what she's doing and what she's trying to do to continue growing as an author and to push herself uh, in the same way that even though Bardugo was lauded and it, like got a TV show series at like like out of it no and it's true there were things that were good about bardugo in the initial book that are then better in in ninth house and it's it's better fits her her style um i don't know we'll see i find again authors become very complacent when they're told that they're great and they don't even in this book like the book becomes worse as time goes on like clearly they had an editor at first and then the editor was just like man eh, whatever i'm gonna take a time off oh wait have any of you read the sequel oh is the God. sequel already out is it heat around the world uh, is the sequel. I didn't know there had been, I, I knew they were probably going to write one because it sets up for one. Did it come out yet? Is it one of, the, it has Goodreads reviews, but sometimes that doesn't mean anything. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, Winds of Winter also has Goodreads yeah, reviews. Yeah, it, it, it's not out. August 22nd, 2023. I edit, I have an arc. Okay, okay, never mind. These people have arcs. Okay, yeah, that was probably our longest video to date. Um, we'll see how much I end up cutting it down, but we're looking at about two and a half hours here. Thank you for our patrons for reading this with us. <laughs> that was very cathartic to complain about it as I was going through it um, yesterday. Um, if you're in our Parasocial Darlings tier, our first um, live stream should be next Saturday. I think we're going to be doing the Savior Sister. Um, I want Katie to suffer more, so that should be fun. Remember that those videos are exclusive to the patrons at that air, uh, that that, that tier. tier i'll probably release like 10 minutes or so to tease people um but otherwise that's more or less where it is um any last thoughts i can understand why a lot of people really like this book i think it is i think the gender exploration it's doing is not one that people regularly see i just i don't think it is as good as it could have been for what it was trying to do uh but if you liked it i'm super glad and you know that makes sense. People, a lot of the times, like we just had someone 
comment on our priory of the orange tree video uh well maybe because you're american you don't understand a lot of people really love this book and so it's one of those things and i've thought that too when i've really loved a book and somebody didn't like it i'm just like you didn't understand it and like maybe they understood it and it's just not their cup of tea and it doesn't work for them and the things but that doesn't mean like there have been books that i've loved and then when i read the one star reviews and i'm like oh yeah it's, so much of that is true I just liked it anyway. I think it's okay to like this book. I think though it's diff. I don't think it's legitimately good at exploring the ideas in it though. I mean, I think, it, I think it's just a trash fire in that respect. It's, it's nice that it brought up these ideas and you might enjoy the book. Um, but I don't, it's not a good argument. Like if this was an essay, it fails. I feel like it really was too, t it, it got too tied up in having to tell the historical story it was telling and too tied up in the fantasy fate thing to give its characters agency to allow the, the uh, ideas to be explored. Because unfortunately, it's really hard to explore these ideas if you have to get through the historical stuff you have to tell. Again, George Washington as a woman is actually not super interesting. Like that really has nothing to do with taxation without representation. Like, you know, it, it, it's it, they're they're badly fitted. But OK, sign us up. Thanks for watching, guys. We'll talk to you next time. Bye.